right, Ms. Kendra, take it away. I mean, Kirsten. Okay, hang on one second. I'm so sorry. I am just going to make sure I have this on my end. Okay, well, good morning, afternoon, or evening, and hello, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us today for the third annual Suicide Prevention and Awareness Symposium. I am one of your hosts, Kirsten A.V. I'm a staff member at American Public University System. I have a few housekeeping items before we get started. Uh, please note at the bottom of your screen is the chat feature. Feel free to type any questions, thoughts, comments in the chat box as we go through our presentations today. We do have Active Minds moderators here and others to help with any questions you may have. Um, also, we wanted to let you know that there are resources available to you um, and will be mentioned throughout the webinars. Um, so if you don't feel comfortable leaving a comment or any questions, uh, they will be available to you. Uh, so with that being said, at this time, I would like to do a quick sound check and make sure we have our presenter here today and ready to go. Uh, Dr. Mary Cooper, can you hear me okay? And you may need to come off mute. Yes, I'm here. Wonderful. Okay, we've can got you. Me? Yep, we can hear you. So oh, good. Um, if you're ready to go, then I will turn it over to you. All right. Whoop, whoop. Right, today I'm going to be talking about suicide and COVID-19 and what I'm going to talk about maybe some things that you already know about and some things that you may go hmm I didn't think about it that way or have a different perspective on it um, but as I always say there's a picture of me have low expectations and that way you won't be disappointed sometimes we have these great big expectations and we walk away going you know I'm disappointed because that such and such didn't happen. So just have low expectations. You won't be disappointed. And I'm also going to say, I'm from Georgia, in case you were wondering, you're trying to figure out, was that South Carolina? Was that Texas? No, that's Georgia. And my mama always had something to say, like Forrest Gump's mama. So mm -hmm. she always said that life was like a buffet. Take what you want and leave the rest. So that's still true today and what I'm going to talk about. I want to start out by um, most of you have probably heard of 13 Reasons Why. It was a very popular um, book series, and it was also a series on TV, and they had several seasons of that. And uh, one of the things that Jay Asher always talks about is everything affects everything. And so sometimes we may not be able to see, um, well, how did that happen? But then you can see, I always think about the Old Testament when it says, you know, Abraham begot this person and begot that person, begot that person. So sometimes we see things that affect everything. And in the past, when I've worked with patients who were, um, had suicidal thoughts, um, they may talk about something that uh, happened to them when they were in the second grade or the seventh grade and they're, they're 50 or 60 years old or what have you. And you think, well, how did that happen? Well, we'll also see out throughout the presentation, as Jay said, everything affects everything. So here's a little quick overview of what I was gonna talk about today. Um, and that is, uh, what is COVID? What is suicide? And what about the data? And what's COVID related? may not be a suicide that is from someone who actually has COVID, but it may be COVID related. Everything affects everything. And then I'm gonna wrap up from there. So when we think about what is COVID, I'm looking at the um, World Health Organization said that COVID-19 is the name given by the World Health Organization on February the 11th of 2020 for the disease caused by the novel novel coronavirus. 
So we probably already know that it's an infectious disease caused by a newly discovered coronavirus. And Rhea, I don't have control, so. And then I always like to define things that I'm talking about. So like, what is suicide? Well, according to the National Institute of Mental Health, suicide is defined as a death caused by self-directed injurious behavior with intent to die as a result of that behavior. So once again, everything affects everything. So suicide may or may not be something that, um, um, that you have thought of traditionally in the past. It may be a cause of COVID-19 may be a cause of the suicide, whether directly or indirectly. And I, I don't have control over the, um, I'm sorry. Okay, Ms. Cooper, just one second, I'll do it for you. And, and just okay, say, ne thank just say you. next when you want the next slide. Okay, thank you. So I just threw in a couple of quotes here that we've probably um, heard before Shakespeare say, to be or not to be, that is the question. So the question's been around for a very long time. And um, Liang said, people commit suicide for only one reason, to escape torment. That whatever their situation is, that they're, they feel mentally or physically tormented. Next. So if we're looking at the data, according to the CDC right now, we're not gonna be able to fully have the, the data that we need to gather and evaluate for at least two years. Um, I was hoping to have more current data, but um, we're just gonna go on, um, you know, what we've been able to, to gather at this point. Next. Thank you, Ree. So recently during a um, Buck Institute webinar uh, that streamed on July the 14th, the CDC director, Robert Redford, Redfield said that roughly 146,000 people have died from COVID or COVID related causes in the US according to the CDC data. Next. And so what we know so far is the most recent publicized federal data records 48,000 deaths from suicide and at least 1.4 million attempts in 2018. So in 2018, almost 71,000 people died from drug overdoses. The US has also ha has so far had more than 200,000 more deaths than it would in an average year, according to a science alert that was examined by the CC CDC um, data. Now, of those drug overdoses, how many were intentional and how many were suicide? We don't have the data currently for that. Next. Now, what I'd like to look at is suicides due to COVID and some related COVID suicides. And even though we have safety measures, um, during social distancing, um, we can notice that um, we know that um, social distancing is helping to reduce the spread and the potential for adverse outcomes on suicide risk is still high because what the data is showing is that from June the 24th to June 30th of this year, that the CDC did report that the US adults did report mental health conditions were higher in numbers and they were contributing that to COVID-19. Now there were some surveys that were taken and they were in mental health um, clinicians, uh, doctors were asking patients, um, what are you stressed about? And the number one thing that they would say was COVID-19. Um, the CDC also reported and showed that 40.9% of adults say that they've had at least one mental health effect that was directly due to COVID-19. And this included symptoms. Um, this included, um, this included, you know, actually talking to patients. 
this showed that showed anxiety and depression that was 30.9 percent there were symptoms of trauma or stress related disorder was 26.3 percent and starting to increase substance use to actually cope was found 13.3 percent of the people that were actually in this particular study next Now what I'd like to look at, because everything affects everything, is if we don't have the actual data and it's gonna take two years to actually come up with you know, the best data looking back over what's going on right now, we can actually look at crisis lines and helplines. And I, I've worked on crisis helplines before and when you answer the call, you never know exactly who's gonna be on the other end. And a lot of times it can be a, somebody who's thinking about suicide. Well, the Disaster Distress Helpline, a federal crisis hotline, has seen a huge spike in calls of people seeking help recently. And the National Helpline um, by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services, Services provides counseling for people facing emotional distress during times of natural and human disasters. So in March of this year, the helpline saw a 338% increase in call volume compared with just the month before in February. And that was according to one spokesperson that was a representative of the agency. And compared to last year for the same month in March, this was, um, as you can tell, the percentage was 891% higher increase in calls. Next. Um, one of the things that we can look at is the say, uh, gun sales. And during this time period, we've actually seen gun sales go up. According to the American Federation Foundation of Suicide Prevention in 2018, we do have that data, firearms accounted for 50.57% of all suicidal deaths. Next. So while Americans um, have responded to COVID-19 in a myriad of ways, I'm not saying that all the gun sales increase are due to suicide, but let me just tell you, show you some of the uh, information I gathered. Some broad trends have emerged as data from the first weeks of the pandemic became evident, and we saw that firearms revenue was up 309%, crime was down, but almost all the guns, um, it's, it's, it's almost like guns aren't the problem. That was just a Facebook page from uh, the Shooter's Hangout. And the number appears to be taken from figures published by the online firearms retailer, the ammo.com, which said that it has experienced a 309% increase in revenue just during that time period of February the 23rd through March the 15th, compared to the previous 22 days earlier this year in 2020. So as of April the 1st, the site reports it experienced a 792% increase in revenue from February the 23rd um, to March the 31st. And the company's website reads, and I quote, our growth in sales directly correlates with the public's increasing leeriness of COVID-19. Sales of firearms and ammunition have quickly risen nationally, while reports indicate that crime has fallen in tandem. Next. So while we see from the time period of March the 16th through March the 22nd alone, the FBI conducted almost 1.2 million background checks. Over 210,000 background checks were conducted on March the 20th the new record for the most background checks ever in one day, according to the FBI. FBI also said that it did 3.7 million background checks for firearm purchases in the month of March, and the most ever recorded in a single month by the FBI Bureau, and over 1 million more than um, March of 2019, just a year earlier. Next. Now, 
the ammunition website that ammo.com uh, has said that it's shipping ammunition across the country, except there's four states they cannot ship directly to. So a 77% increase in their website visits. And that was just during that time period of February the 23rd and March the 15th. And a 222% increase in transactions over the same period compared to the first three weeks in February of this year. Another indicator um, that we can um, notice with guns is is the increase in sales is that federal background checks are also on the rise. So these kind of both go hand in hand. And as the picture shows here on the left, if you're, what, if you're looking, it's a long line in front of a gun in a knife store. Uh, if you talk to folks that are selling guns, uh, there was also an increase in wait times. And um, I also talked to a local a businessman who owns a gun shop and he said it's not unusual when he gets to work, especially starting in February, that there's a line already waiting out the door for him. Um, yes, few of them are wearing are not wearing um, a mask. So um, a study by the Harvard School of Public Health reveals a link between the rates of firearm ownership and suicide researchers found that in states where guns were more prevalent, like Wyoming, where 63% of households reported owning guns, rates of suicide were higher. The inverse was also true. Where gun ownership was less common, suicide rates were also lower. And of course, um, next, that would correlate with if you've, um, I've talked to um, uh, patients before, and they said they thought about suicide. And I said, well, how would you do it? And if they said, well, I have a gun in my house. And so I would go in such and such room and sit in such and such chair. So I know that their ideas about doing so were much more intense and much more thought out. But a home that said, I don't have a gun, um, I'm not real sure exactly how I would do it. Um, so I'm not saying all those guns, please don't misunderstand, I'm not saying all those guns were purchased for suicide, but the statistic is that um, the homes that did have a gun, um, they, that did increase the likelihood of a suicide by a gun. So since everything affects everything, we know that COVID-19 has touched every aspect of our life from working to getting married, to being isolated, to our purchasing behaviors, to how I mean, how many of us ever thought we'd be sitting um, in the grocery store parking lot debating what am, I got to go in there and get out. I got to wear my mask. I got to take my hand sanitizer or my gloves or, or instead of uh, going in there to buy dog food, I'm going to get, I'm going to have it shipped to my house online. So um, maybe you've had a death of a loved one or someone that you knew, but they had an online uh, service because they didn't have the, um, the burial or the ritual or only the close family was invited or perhaps they videotaped it and sent it to you or they've postponed it. So we, this has also changed the way we die. Well, there are people that actually do have COVID that are uh, isolated. If um, I've read stories about people saying, I've wanted to go see my mother, I want to see my sister, but they wouldn't let me in the hospital. And um, we've all probably seen stories about healthcare workers who are there videotaping or holding the phone so that family can see their loved ones who are in the hospital. So if you think about it, it's changed almost every aspect of our lives. And so, of course, we've had to look at different types of things. And um, we, we know where there's a will, there's a way, but still there's some things that have changed that may, may never go back. This may be the new normal for certain things. Next. Um, there's little data yet on the COVID-19 pandemic and its impact on the suicide rate, as I mentioned earlier, but clearly the pandemic has added intense emotional and mental stress to the lives of people around the world. We see fear, anxiety, and depression can stem from a wide range of concerns and experiences. And some of those experiences can be personal, some of those can be family related, some of those can be work related. Um, next, so when we see that COVID has affected so many different parts of our lives, 
um, we see that we have stress. We're seeing people that are getting stressed from just being isolated. They're, they they don't want to go back out. They want to be with their friends. Um, I have two teenagers and of course they want to go see their friends. They want their friends to come over. They want to know what their friends are doing. They want to go bowling. They want to go ice skating. They want to get out there. Um, we see that COVID has affected millions of people have lost their jobs because of COVID. Um, we see an increase in job demands too as well. There are healthcare workers. There, there's a need for more healthcare workers. Um, and also that puts a strain on our healthcare workers that are there now. They may be having to do more hours or they're, of course, they're having to learn new techniques to do things, new, um, you know, uh, protection wear. Then there are folks that uh, already have pre-existing conditions, um, such as health and mental issues. Next. And you, we can actually see some of these health and mental issues that are not going to the emergency room to be treated or being turned away from the emergency room because they don't have COVID-19 and they're being told to leave. I actually had um, a client who told me uh, in the middle of the night, she actually called me, it was two in the morning, and she says, um, my baby is sick. I've gone to the emergency room and a nurse has walked me to the exit door and said, how dare you bring a baby here that uh, potentially has COVID-19 to infect the rest of us, go home. And she was just, she said, I don't know what to do. What should I do? I said, well, do you have a pediatrician? Let's call the pediatrician and find out exactly what the pediatrician would like for you to do. So the healthcare workers are being um, um, involved in this. Doctors, nurses, ambulance technicians. Um, can you, let's see. I think it jumped there on me. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So you may have heard in the news about Dr. Um, Lorna Breen. She was medical director at the emergency department in New York at Presbyterian Allen Hospital. She had, in fact, in fact, worked very hard with her patients, and unfortunately, she contracted COVID-19. She took only one week off from work and um, then she went back to work and it was just quite overwhelming. And she went, she was sent back home and at that point decided to, to uh, end her life. And her father had a quote, Lorna Breen, a top New York emergency room doctor had spent weeks contending with coronavirus patients, flooding her hospital, sometimes dying before they could be removed from the ambulance. And uh, I'm sure that took a, a, a big mental and physical toll on her. Her father asked that she be remembered as a hero. And he quoted, make sure she's praised as a hero. She's a casualty just as much as anyone else who has died. Next. And she represents a lot of healthcare workers. And not only are they getting it from the COVID-19 and the pressure of that, but healthcare workers are also being threatened with violence and death. Um, I know a, um, a doctor in New York and he says when his shift is over and he leaves and goes out to uh, catch the bus, there's protesters out there claiming that um, all this is fake and he's just faking it and um, he's worthless and yelling and screaming and and he's actually been pushed on the, uh, the subway as he's going back to his apartment. So according to the Insecurity Insight, um, there was a quote that said, a research group that documents violence against aid workers, there have been more than 400 reported global incidents of COVID-19 related violence affecting healthcare workers and facilities since January. And that's what we know about. Uh, I'm sure that there are other um, things that we're unaware of next that um, may not have been reported. So those, uh, those who died by suicide accounted for 1.7% of the country's more than 2.8 million registered deaths in 2018. The same share as in 2017, but the rate of 14.2 deaths by suicide per 100,000 U.S. standard population was up from the 2017 rate of 14. So the data shows depression and anxiety are already 
um, here in our nation and as well as around the world. There was a tracking poll that was taken by the Kaiser Family Foundation, and that was conducted from the period of March the 25th to March the 30th. Um, I was specifically looking for data during that early time period where things were starting to shut down and had shut down um, to see what kind of effect that they may be having. Well, this particular foundation found that 45% of adults say that the pandemic had affected their mental health and 19% um, say that it has a major impact. Um, this uh, foundation also noticed that the rates were slightly higher among women, Hispanic adults, um, black adults, and that's what the survey said. Nearly half of Americans report the coronavirus crisis is harming their mental health, according to a Kaiser Family Foundation poll. This was a different poll than the survey. A federal emergency hotline for people in emotional distress registered more than 1,000% increase just in April of 2020, compared with the same time last year in 2019. And last month, roughly 20,000 people text the hotline that is run by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health. Next. So according to uh, Talkspace co-founder and CEO, they're also receiving more calls uh, wanting to talk about suicide. Um, they are contemplating suicide. Um, in an article, uh, published by JAMA Psychiatry that was actually published on April the 10th of this year. It was entitled Suicide Mortality and Coronavirus Disease 2019. It's, they're referring to it as a perfect storm because COVID-19, uh, COVID sorry, it must be COVID-19 and the economic challenges are also simultaneously next. So we're seeing things that are not just, um, as Jay Asher talks about, everything affects everything. We're not just seeing COVID, um, the illness affect people, but we're also seeing kind of a domino effect of that. So since the COVID-19 crisis, we've all seen businesses have faced adversity, laying off employees are actually closing, schools have been closed for an indeterminable amount of periods. They're opening back up now, but they're also um, closing. I know a school in my town, a middle school, after half of the student body tested positive, and a fourth of the teachers now have tested positive, even though they opened in August last week, the superintendent closed the school. Um, this is forcing parents and, uh, and guardians to take off from work or to stay home with the children. Um, we're looking at homeschooling. That's another stressor that parents had not had previously before that were non-homeschooling parents. The stock market has experienced a historic drops resulting in significant changes in retirement funds. Uh, some of the 401ks have been cut or reduced. Existing research suggests that sustained economic stress could be associated with higher U.S. suicide rates in the future. Next. So as we notice in here, we're going to businesses and seeing that they're closed. And um, we've seen that 30 to 40 million jobs have been lost due to the economic shutdown in 2020 as compared to only 2.6 million in uh, 2008. So there's a significant increase in job loss and a lot of that is due to um, COVID-19. Next. So suicidal thoughts and behaviors are often associated also with social isolation and loneliness. And we see in suicide prevention perspective, it is concerning that the most official public health strategy for the COVID-19 crisis is social distancing. Well, that's also going to put more pressure on our social isolation. Um, my son, um, who's away uh, in college, he said that um, he's in law school right now. And he said that two weekends ago when they, they went, they had a break, and then when they went back on Monday, their chairs were pushed 10 feet apart because one of the law students had proven that we, they needed to be 10 feet apart instead of six feet apart. And so the whole, the whole building, none of the other buildings at the campus had been changed, but that particular building had been changed. So I asked my son, I said, how did that feel? He said, well, increase the social isolation from six feet to 10 feet. So um, he said it was just, it, he said, and they didn't know that that was going to happen. He said they had expected the rooms to look the way they did. 
And so that just kind of created some more apprehension, he said, among the students and more, why is this? And, you know, we thought it was going to be this way. And now we're showing up and it's this way. So I'm sure that that's not, that people are being surprised all over the world going to work and they're not being work or the child going to school and then they're not being school or they're being sent home. But the suicidal thoughts and behaviors that, that can be associated with social isolation and loneliness. Therefore, from a suicide prevention perspective, it's concerning that the most critical public health strategy for the COVID-19 crisis is social distancing. So it's almost as if um, when you have, uh, it's like, there again, everything affects everything else. It's kind of ironic that we're involved in social isolation, but yet that could be a solution to part of our problem. But in turn, since everything affects everything else, it can also create, it can actually create more problems for the social distancing and creating more social isolation. So um, furthermore, family and friends remain isolated from individuals who are hospitalized. Um, we, we've seen more and more people, unfortunately, who are having to die alone. They're having to die without holding their daughter's hand or their mother's hand or whatever. And even when their deaths are imminent, they're not allowed to go be with them in the nursing home or facility or hospital or wherever they may be. So to the extent that these strategies increase social isolation and loneliness, they may also increase um, suicide risk. Next. One of the things that we've seen in isolation is so many people have community events, whether that's visiting the synagogue, whether that's visiting church, whether that's visiting the temple, whatever type of religious activity that they may have, whatever type of, um, it may be a social club, the Optimist Club, Kiwana Club, whatever that uh, club may be. Um, it may be going to your, your, your daughter's school to get ready for the, uh, the prom, the homecoming uh, football game, whatever it may be. There's a various community and religious activities that, uh, that for a time period were canceled. And now, even though a lot of them are opening back up, some of them are starting to close again. And I know um, several of them that you have to take attendance. You have, I mean, you have to take uh, you have to get like a reservation, you have to call or go online, and then a, a building that traditionally held X amount of people, say a thousand people, now can only hold 200 people. So then there's the anxiety every week of how um, am I going to be able to go back to the synagogue? Am I going to be able to go back to my daughter's um, you know, we, are we going to plan the wedding? What, what exactly are we going to be able to do? So there's a myriad of problems and issues that comes from not being able to be connected with your community, with your religious activities. Weekly attendance of religious services has been associated with a five-fold lower suicide rate compared with those who did not attend some type of community or religious activity. The effects of closing churches and community centers may further contribute to that social isolation and hence suicide. Next. So isolating us from our friends, from our connected family, and some people go to church activities or these types of activities, and that is their family. They may be closer to their friends and their other uh, activities, the people in that community, they are actually to their family. So we see COVID-19 patients are isolated too as well. So they, their support group, mentally, their support group um, has been removed and they may die alone. And loved ones who are not allowed to be there are often flooded with emotions. Sometimes I've talked to, um, I'm working with two clients who have lost someone directly to COVID-19 and they're filled with a lot of guilt. Uh, but what if I could have done this? What if I could have broken security? What about if I'd taken my mother someplace else? What about if I'd taken my dad over? A lot of different types of emotions are flooded with suicide, but also now that isolation and the barrier of not being able to be with the loved one. And some loved ones are actually breaking through security at hospitals and nursing homes to be with their loved ones. Now, that can be for different reasons. Next, they could be wanting to be there because they want to be there or they are going there with the purpose of knowing my loved one's dying, I intentionally want to contract COVID-19, therefore we can die together or shortly thereafter, or that may, they may be using COVID-19 as a reason for that would be their suicide, or they could say, you know, 
if I do it this way, then the insurance will still pay off to my family because I didn't commit suicide. I was able to get um, a disease. I was able to contract this illness and that's what killed me. But let's think about all the various situations that COVID-19 has created for suicides. So there may be um, like our doctor that we talked about earlier, um, she actually did have COVID-19 and she committed suicide because she, um, uh, she had that and she had her own ideas about perhaps where that may lead and the mental stress with being a healthcare worker. So we know there's a lot of people that are in that situation who do have COVID-19. Um, losing a loved one and then completing a suicide due to their death. So it's a COVID-19 related death or someone who wants to die. So the person intentionally, as I mentioned, breaks through security um, with the hopes of contracting COVID-19 so that they you know, would be able to complete the suicide. And then of course, there's people that have lost their jobs, they've lost their income. Um, we see uh, there are folks that, that don't have alternatives. They're not able to work online. They're not able to find a job that um, for their abilities or education or training or background. So they lose hope in getting a job. They lose hope in, in creating an income for themselves and or their families next. And of course, the loss of job can increase uh, stress. Uh, I remember talking to a doctor one time and he was saying a lot of people are coming in now and saying that they've lost their jobs or no, they're saying they've got a lot of stress due to their job. And he says, well, there's a lot of stress if you don't have a job. There's personal and family concerns and situations of course vary, but the personal and family issues that conclude are just fear that you and your loved ones are going to get COVID-19. You may not have it, you may not know of anyone, may not have any in the family, but you could get the fear of, oh my gosh, my daughter's gonna get it, my mother's gonna get it, my sister who's got pre-existing conditions and no chance to be with or comfort your loved ones, as we've mentioned, who are seriously ill or dying in the hospital. And that may be also uh, not because of COVID-19. You may actually have a loved one who's in the hospital um, because of another illness, but because of COVID-19, you can't um, go and visit them. There's grief over the loss of a loved one due to COVID-19 or other illnesses. There's the social isolation we've talked about from different, um, uh, not being able to go to funerals, not being able to go to weddings, not being able to go to those baby showers or, or um, people that are celebrating different anniversaries or religious holidays and you wouldn't be able to meet for what you would usually gather for. So there's grief over the loss of the event. There's a grief over the loss of the loved one, the social isolation, especially if you live alone or in a facility where visitors are temporary or not allowed at this time. Being in close quarters with family under stay at home orders, which could increase the risk of your spouse or partner or child abuse could also increase during this time period. Those are other concerns. Um, alcohol can be, um, I looked at some uh, studies that alcohol and drug uh, purchases have increased and misuse have increased. Next, police officers are reporting an increase in domestic violence. Um, more people are staying at home, more people, as you know, because of the isolation, um, we're seeing that other, these other problems with the domino effect are also increasing. Next. Thank you, Ree. <laughs> We're seeing work-related concerns. We're seeing signs like this. Um, if you're on the, the Zoom meeting, you see it says, due to COVID-19, our store is closed to the public. However, phone orders with curbside pickups are available. So depending on the type of job you have, there are examples of work-related issues that include anxiety due to working in a high-risk environment, such as in a hospital or a nursing home, or even being a first responder. And these people are feeling overwhelmed and imagine how their families are feeling for them every day when they go to work. Um, they're working in crowded healthcare facilities often um, that treat people with COVID-19, especially in places that may have a shortage of personnel or personal protective equipment. Um, there's anxiety of having to reuse that equipment over again, where in the past they were able to throw it away or not have the equipment. There's all kinds of concerns. There's feeling of burnout. There's the frustration that healthcare workers are feeling because they don't, uh, they they couldn't help everybody. Like the doctor um, that committed suicide, she talked about uh, and completed suicide. 
she talked about the overwhelming, if you look at any of the articles that have been published about her, the people were dying in the ambulances before they could even get in the hospital. She said she couldn't even get to them to help them. So that was a, a heavy burden that she felt. There was the fear and anxiety about the increased risk of COVID-19. Um, because we're in, with the essential workers and such as workers that are um, in food and transportation industry, some of those have been stopped. Imagine those people, um, I know of a program called Meals on Wheels. Those, uh, the friend of mine, she helps volunteer with Meals on Wheels. They deliver 200 meals a day and in March, to March till June, they could not deliver any meals. So she personally started taking it on herself to try to gather food and take it and leave it on people's front porches, put it in bags and mailboxes. And it was just breaking her heart that she couldn't do what she normally did. But she said, these people depend on me. There's no family, there's no friends and the other volunteers have quit. So she was trying to do this all on her own. So there's fear and anxiety about the increased risk of COVID-19 because of you know, the essential workers. And there's worry about the actual loss of the job. Those folks who still have a job, a lot of them are living in fear of any day, my job can be cut or my coworker's job has been cut. When are they gonna cut my job? That of course creates financial hardship on that person as well as the family. And they worry about how are they gonna provide for their family? How are they gonna provide needs for the family? And if you're out of work for an unpredictable amount of time, what are our choices? What else can I do next? Um, if, if you're not aware of this, the CDC actually puts out a death forecast. And right now, um, as of this past week, they're forecasting about what they foresee for the end of October. The week's national ensemble forecast indicates an uncertain trend in new COVID-19 deaths reported over the next four weeks and predicts that 3,000 to 7,100 new deaths will likely be reported during the week ending October the 10th of 2020. The national ensemble predicts that a total of 207,000 to 218,000 COVID-19 deaths will be reported by this date. Next. But I'm gonna conclude here and I just wanna say that there is hope. And I think that one of the ways that we can all hope is with, with new challenges, there also comes new opportunities. Throughout this whole thing, I thought about, yeah, that's really bad. That statistic is really bad. That's, that's horrible. Oh my gosh, gun sales are up. Oh my God, there's food shortages. There's no toilet paper you know, on, on the shelves. What am I gonna do? And then I thought, you know what? This is gonna bring about new opportunities. People have lived through other stressful times. People have lived through floods and hurricanes and other pandemics, and we can do it too. And I know that there's, there's hope through medical science. There's hope that there's a vaccine coming. There's hope through that things are going to um, uh, brighten up for us. There may be new inventions that come out of this. And one of the things I, I always remember is those of us who are still connected through social media, that social media that we may need to reach out to. Maybe you haven't heard from a friend in a long time, or maybe there's that aunt that you haven't talked to. Maybe if you just took a few minutes and um, sat down and wrote a little note or a letter, hey, I was thinking about you, something that they could actually hold on to and have in their home and read over and over again. But this reminded me when I was writing uh, this presentation about the Beatles song, I get a little help from my friends. And I think that's true for all of us. And thank you so much for being here. And I hope that like my mama said, life is like a buffet. I thought you were, I hope you're able to gather something from that buffet and take it and share it and uh, remember that there's hope. Dr. Hooper, this is Michelle Lawson. Thank hey, you Michelle. for all the information. Um, before the symposium, some questions were submitted to us and I'm hoping okay. I can ask them right now. There are two of them. All right. Can you speak to how COVID-19 has affected suicide rates among college campuses? Um, I don't have any actual numbers for that, but I do know that there is, it has affected it. We are seeing an increase on those numbers because we know that the call centers and the counselors on campus are reporting those. And I think a lot of that has to do with the isolation, not being able to be with their friends, but also 
um, hopefully they're reaching out to their friends through social media. That's one very positive thing about social media is because of this. Unfortunately, and I can speak for the campus where uh, my, my two are at right now, um, there's a lot of fear, there's a lot of anxiety, um, they're noticing uh, a lot of isolation. A lot of the, the students are having to, are testing positive and they're going to have to go back to their dorm room or see the class on Zoom. But of course, uh, going back to the dorm room, there may be two, three other people that are living actually in that room with you. So we are seeing an increase, but exactly what type of impact. I do know that there's a lot of um, calls, <coughs> excuse me, that are coming in to um, local resources that are asking to go to hospitals and to universities and also to religious um, organizations as well with an outcry for help. All right, thank you. The other question is, uh, someone says, even online teachers worry about the loss of job during the COVID-19 pandemic. What are the best self-protecting remedies you can recommend? Um, I was reading an article the other day that said 86.7% of all doorknobs carry bacteria. And that in the past, um, we had copper doorknobs. Well, copper doorknobs, as you know, have all been replaced. So if you want to, I take my shirt, I pull my shirt up and I use it if I don't have like a tissue or I have gloves on or something like that. But um, it was different types of bacteria that was on there, but they found E. coli and salmonella. And they said that that was a big way to cut down on uh, virus transfers to not you know, actually touch the doorknob. I do know that um, there are actually little tools that you can buy now that um, like for latches, it's like a hook. And then the other thing looks like, um, have you ever been on a golf course where you see somebody picking up balls with a stick and it's got like a, like a, like that hand that you see in the toy story where it picks up the toy <laughs> and grabs it and drops it um, like that. I've seen those actually grabbing the doorknob and turning. So I think that's one way that we can, um, you know, just not touch doorknobs would I think would be an effective way. Um, of course, uh, I've heard, you know, wearing the mask, changing the mask regularly. Um, I will tell you this on a, on a side note, because we do have a few minutes. Um, I actually uh, taught in uh, Vietnam last fall uh, for fall semester and wearing a mask in Asian countries is not unusual. Uh, they go out, they wear masks and my students were nice enough to come pick me up every morning for class and take me back to my apartment and um, on, on a scooter. Yes, I rode a scooter in Hanoi. I have, I have lived the dream. Um, so uh, they would come and they realized I didn't have a mask and so they would open up their scooter and they would give me a mask. Well, I was so proud of myself early on. It was like my first week there. There was a, a young man who had taken me the day before and he gave me a mask. And so he was taking me back to my apartment and I was so proud of myself. I pulled the mask out and I said, I'm so thankful you gave me this mask. I want you to know I kept it from yesterday. And as I'm about to put it on my face, he reaches over and knocks it out of my hand <laughs> and he says, you wore that yesterday. That's the filthiest thing I think I've ever seen. You cannot wear that again. And as I'm reaching over to pick it up off the ground to go throw it away, he goes, no, no, no. He said, you have to wear the mask every day, throw it away. So I think that that's one of the things that I learned while I was, was um, there in Vietnam. And I've also taught in China before as well. And they wear masks every single day. And that does not seem to be an issue. So I think that we, we need to become more aware of wearing a mask and making sure that it's a clean one or washing it or it's worn effectively. Um, and also just constantly washing our hands as we've, we've heard before, because um, if you look back at the fellow who actually started, who was the medical doctor who started washing his hands and found out that it decreased on uh, bacteria, it decreased in infections in his patients. He was ridiculed and criticized for doing that and that created a lot of anxiety for him. But it's still true today what he discovered and washing the hands will still, you know, help all of us wash our hands, wear our mask and don't touch the doorknob. So I guess that's, that's my mother advice for the day. <laughs> Thank you, this is Michelle again. We received an additional question. All right. What advice, 
What advice would you offer to isolated students, especially ones who love social interaction? Um, well, there's different kinds of things that you can get involved with, like some games. I know that there's online uh, games you can get involved with. There's online chess that you can play. Chess players all over the world um, that you can find some, you can make actually some new connections. Think about what kind of hobbies you have. I have a Scottish Terrier, and I have, I go to a Facebook uh, that's, that's called For the Love of Scotties. And I also, I see Scotties all over the world. And they're, they're neat. Uh, you might go there and see a Scotty at the Eiffel Tower. You might go there and see a Scotty in Germany or Egypt or whatever. It, and to me, that's interesting to see different people doing that. There's another site that I go to called um, uh, For the Windows of the World. And it's, uh, it's just different people around the world. And it's their view from their window that day. And um, also another thing you can do, there's wonderful sites of travel that people who love to travel. I think Facebook's a great place to, to meet people that have hobbies like yours and to keep your mind interested in, in different things and find a book club to join. There's local libraries that have taken their book clubs online. Um, they introduce different books each week. Uh, find out what you're interested in and try to connect with people that um, are interested in those kind of things. And there's just all kinds of wonderful um, interactions that you can come up with that are through social media. Thank you. We have one last question. Do you have okay. any suggestions on how to explain COVID to younger children? Um, and it's the it's been my experience that that younger children are much more adaptable than adults are. It's like when we start dealing with adults, it's like, well, I've always done it this way, and this is the way I'm going to continue to do it. But with children, they become adaptable. And um, I'm hearing from, um, uh, and I actually saw an interview with Jimmy Kimmel and Ice-T, and Ice-T said that his four-year-old won't let him walk out the door without his mask. And the four-year-old has become adapted to wearing the mask and understanding that. And I think that there's some, um, if you look online, there's some books or little literature out there about how to explain um, diseases to uh, children. And I think the best way to do is, I've always felt like uh, if a child could ask a question, they were ready for the answer. And so if they're asking what's going on, I think we need to be very honest with them. But as always, at the end, um, I try to give people hope and try to give them understanding that this is what we're doing right now. It may not be forever, it may not be for long, but just for right now. And I explain things, and when, when I was growing up, my mother periodically would, she, she wasn't a, a large individual, but every now and then she'd wanna lose some weight. And she was known as the cake maker. Anybody who died at our church or community would call her and ask for uh, her to make her chocolate cake for you know the food gatherings after the funeral. And so my mother would make this cake, but when she would be on a diet, it was beautiful cake, delicious cake, great icing, great uh, layers. You just, you just, people would crave that chocolate cake. And um, she would not eat any of the chocolate cake when she was on a diet. And I said, but mother, how can you resist this most beautiful chocolate cake? It's a great chocolate cake. You know, it's delicious. You, you know, you want it. And she would say, yes, I do. I've tasted it before and I will taste it again, but I choose not to do so today. So I think that's, a, that's what we need to think about with COVID. You know, we have been to the grocery store before, we have been to the synagogue, we have been to the church, we have been to the bowling alley, but we just choose not to go today. So I think that's kind of the answer for the, for the kids and try to uh, come up with some other alternatives that we can do at home, some types of uh, games perhaps that we can do, and that old fashioned Monopoly board is still available. <laughs> I find out when you play games with children, they'll often tell you what's in their heart so you can have a real down to, down to find out what's going on with them. And as my mother used to say also, just don't think that children's problems, oh, that's just their problem. That's just a little problem. That's just nothing. It's a big problem for them. If they're uh, four or five, nine years old, it might not, it might look like a little problem to us, but it's a big problem to them. So just be honest and just explain that things have changed right now. But um, as I always find out with change, it's inevitable and it will change again. Thank you, Dr. Cooper. We have no other questions. 
Awesome. Well, thank you so much for letting me be here today and sharing with you. And I hope that everybody was able to take something from the buffet. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Cooper. That was really amazing and shocking and all the other th things that I think I'm going to have to take it in a little later. <laughs> um, Ms. Kirsten, we're going to go ahead and move on to Jennifer Blazier um, for a couple of minutes, and then I'll throw up the up next screen when she's done. Sounds good. Good morning-ish to everyone. It's almost noon here in Texas. Um, I am going to go through and talk about mindfulness for a few minutes. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have heard the word mindfulness before. Um, mindfulness can help in a lot of ways. So I'm going to go over just a few brief um, uh, pieces of information about it. And then I'm going to walk us through a guided uh, meditation for a few minutes. A little bit different maybe than something you're, you're normally used to when it comes to meditating. Um, so, but it's my favorite. So let me start with how mindfulness really helps us um, when it comes to mental health. Um, resiliency is a big thing, right? But we also, we, we talk about being resilient without talking about um, the breakdown of what that means and how to get there sometimes. Um, mindfulness is just one of the many tools you can use in that area. So, Mindfulness helps with um, staying present and engaged in the moment. Um, it helps us stay focused. Um, it's important. It allows you to accept challenges um, in a way to be able to take purposeful action with them. Um, it helps with stress and adversity and anxiety. So science, um, or I should say research, has actually demonstrated that mindfulness um, is linked to things like better quality of sleep, um, better physical health, and better mental health. So this is what I'm going to ask all of you to do for a few minutes, okay? So you don't have to turn your mic microphones on, you don't turn your video on. But we're going to do a present moment awareness meditation is what this is called, okay? So for this, I want you to practice this in a comfortable position. So not one where you're actually gonna fall asleep, but I want you to get comfortable. So the aim here is to have an alert mind, but a relaxed body where you're going through it, okay? So sitting upright is more effective than lying down. So I'm gonna sit up in my seat. Um, experiment with your posture a little bit, take a minute to get set up, but I want you to be comfortable here. Um, Make sure if, you're, if you are sitting that your sit bones are even, your feet are grounded, um, and that you are just with me for just a few minutes here. So because the mind has a natural tendency to think and wander, I don't know if any of you have the same issue that I do. You lay down at night and you're thinking about the laundry and the appointment tomorrow and I forgot to write something in my calendar and all the things and it's hard to kind of be in the moment and fall asleep. So this helps me in that arena. So what we're going to do is we're going to try to keep your mind occupied with relatively basic tasks, okay? So when you first meditate, your mind is going to be like this unruly teenager, maybe undisciplined, wanting its own way, right? So as a beginner, we're going to give the, lot, the mind lots to focus on as we go through this. And as you improve um, your meditation skills, you'll be able to give it fewer and simpler objectives to focus on. So like I said, this is called present moment awareness, and it simply turns your attention inwards to all of your senses. Okay, so our goal is to shift from thinking to sensing and feeling. So the first step is, <clears throat> let me start here. So because we want to move towards this endless cycle of thinking, right? So we have this inner gatekeeper that we need to talk to real quick before we start. So this gatekeeper controls what comes in my mind, what stays out of the mind. Right? So we need to give this gatekeeper very clear instructions at the beginning to kind of help us. So what I want you to do is silently to yourself with your full attention, I want you to repeat the phrase, 
Now is the time to be aware of the present moment. Right now. It's time to be aware of the present moment. So now we're going to begin. So I want you to get in that comfortable position that you can hold for several minutes without any trouble. Keep your spine straight but comfortable. Place your hands in your lap. It doesn't matter if they're up or down. Put both feet on the floor if you can. I can barely reach. <laughs> And I want you to gently close your eyes. I want you to begin by paying attention to your breathing. Notice any sensations that occur as you focus on your breath. So you might feel the cool air entering your nostrils. You might feel the muscles around your ribs and abdomen expanding and contracting. Maybe the warm air exiting your nostrils. Be aware of all the feelings that your body feels as you breathe. But I want you to let yourself just be an observant. I don't want you to try to change anything. Just allow it naturally to breathe and your body to feel. So stay present as you focus on that breath. If your mind wanders, just bring it back to the present and remind yourself that to be in the moment. So for sounds, I want you to focus on the most obvious sound you hear in the room outside of my voice. Maybe your kids are playing, maybe there's a TV on. As your concentration gets sharper, I want you to bring that sense a little bit closer. Notice the more subtle sounds. Maybe there's birds in the background, distant traffic. Allow all these sounds to wash over you. Letting go of all of it, just let it pass by, be present. And allow your thoughts to come back closer to your bubble. What do you smell right now? Start farther away from you. Maybe you can smell breakfast that you cooked this morning or your pot of coffee that you have on. Just observe them. As you're breathing and smelling, remind yourself to be right here, right now. Take that smell and bring it closer to your bubble. Do you smell your perfume? Maybe your coffee breath, right? Again, don't allow any judgment. You're only observing these scents and these feelings. Now coming back into your body as your eyes are still closed, feel your arms resting on your lap. Feel the weight of your hands. Feel your feet on the ground. What is the temperature of your environment? Is it hot? Is it cold? Is it just right? Feel your clothes against your skin. Notice any pains, muscle tightness, maybe fluttering in your stomach, any anxious feelings. Now while focusing on your breath still, I want you to breathe really deep. Take a nice, slow, deep breath so you can feel the exhale and the muscles throughout your body. Take several of these breaths. Watch how your sensation shifts, even if it's very slight. Letting go of all the tension in the feelings and be present to what you feel. Be present to what arises. Acknowledge it, let it pass through you. Return to your thoughts at the moment. The thoughts in your mind about what you haven't done yet today, what didn't get done yesterday, allow them to pass. Don't get caught up in them. Don't feel like you have to act on them. Some thoughts are nonsense and others are so compelling that you feel to follow them. But just observe them, label them, and let them go. For example, if you're thinking I'm, up, I'm upset over an insult that I received from a friend, 
you might label that as hurt feelings. Let it go and let your next thoughts arise. Let them go too. Think of your thoughts like watching clouds passing by in the sky, right? You're, pro you're progressing towards this blue sky mind where storm clouds pass and your mind can be clear, calm, and alert just in the moment right now. Concentrating on your breathing. Watch the natural changes in your breath as you become more relaxed. You might notice that your breath starts shallow and fast, but becomes deeper and more regular as you relax. When you're ready, take a long, relaxing breath again. One that maybe you can feel in your fingers and your toes. Remind yourself that being present takes practice. Thank yourself for showing up and giving yourself a minute to relax and refocus. Thank yourself for being amazing and slowly open your eyes. There are many different ways to practice mindfulness. This is just one of them. The more you practice, the less prompts you'll need and the easier it will become to stay in the moment. You can do this anywhere, in your car, in bed, in front of a Zoom meeting. Bringing yourself back present allows your body to relax and just be without the stresses that you know are gonna come with the day. So give yourself those minutes to relax and refocus so you can offer a better version of yourself. <clears throat> Katie Reed has a quote out that I love. Self-care means giving the world the best of you instead of what is left of you. I feel like mindfulness is just one of those tools to help in that arena. Thank you for giving me a few minutes of your time. I hope you're a little bit more relaxed now um, and can take a minute to enjoy the rest of our presentations for today. Thank you so much, Ms. Jen. That was, that was awesome. Um, as an Arcalep, I totally almost fell asleep. Uh, but <laughs> if I have a wandering thought, it's don't fall asleep, don't fall asleep, don't fall asleep. All right, Ms. Kirsten, I'm gonna go ahead and throw up our next screen. We can prep us for our intermission. Let folks take a break. Yes, thank you, Jen. I think I need you as my personal mindfulness coach if you have the time. <laughs> that was very nice and very relaxing. I think just what we needed, especially on a day like today where there's a lot of overwhelming and uh, intense conversations. So thank you for that. And thank you, Dr. Mary Cooper, for your presentation. We appreciate you. And so next we have Dr. Kendra Lowe. Um, she will be coming on at 1.15 p.m. Eastern time here. So uh, we've got about 10 minutes. If you would like to take, uh, get up, take a walk, uh, go take a break, and we will see you back here in about 10 minutes. So thanks so much. Okay, hi, hello everyone, welcome back. Uh, it is about quarter after one Eastern time here, so thank you for hanging in. I uh, hope that you got a chance to get up and take a little break or a little walk on this beautiful fall day. Uh, so up next now we have Dr. Kendra Miller. Uh, Dr. Miller, thank you for joining, or I'm sorry, Dr. Kendra Lowe, excuse me. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Um, and you will be uh, talking to us about a guide to self-preservance and can you hear me okay? Just wanna make sure we get you off mute. I can, can you hear me? I can, wonderful, thank you so much, welcome. And if you're ready, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Okay, thank you so much. First, I uh, wanna start out and thank Ms. Brown for inviting me any chance, and I'll say this every time, any chance I get to talk about um, stress and how it affects us all. I'm so excited because my hope is that someone listening today that it gives you um, some hope and faith that you're not alone and that there are others out there that can be struggling and that the more we come together, the more we talk about this, 
uh, the more aware we are and the more um, we can support each other. And especially um, in 2020, uh, as we're going through some crazy times. So uh, I do I would love if you guys uh, ask questions in the chat room. I'm going to try to track that um, throughout the presentation. If I don't get to them, um, I know the moderators are on there as well. So hopefully um, I have a chance to answer any of your questions as we go through the presentation. So please don't hesitate um, to reach out throughout the presentation. So I'd like to start out with just a story um, that I enjoy sharing when before we go into what stress really is. And um, in 2013, it's hard to believe um, that far back, my husband was getting ready to go on another deployment. And I think at that point, I probably lost track how many deployments he had been on. And being a military spouse and not wanting to ask for help, um, I typically stayed home and endured most of it uh, alone. But this time, I had a two-week-old, a 18-month-old, and a three-year-old, and decided to pack up and head from North Carolina to Chicago to get a little bit of family help with this one with the three little ones. So we drove up to Chicago and I had the three kids and our dog and settled into my mom's house and the kids were not sleeping well at that young of an age. But um, I came down that morning a little haggard probably from a long night and my mom was blaring Fox News being probably a Fox News junkie. And I grabbed a cup of coffee and I heard um, blaring over Fox News was the report US military uh, evacuates embassy staff from Yemen over a terrorist threat. Americans are urged to leave. And what made me stop in my tracks at that moment was the fact that my husband was there in Yemen at the embassy. And the harder part of it is that no one knew he was there. So this particular deployment, uh, I wasn't allowed to share his location, uh, how long he was going to be there, um, any details about the deployment. And so in that moment when I heard that, I knew that not only um, was he in real danger, but I couldn't share that anxiety and concern and stress with family members uh, because I wasn't allowed to tell them there was, that he was there. So I kind of took a deep breath and that day um, we already had planned to take my two daughters down to the American Girl Doll store in Chicago and, and really not being able to pause uh, and let anyone take notice that anything significant was going on, we decided to go uh, continue our trip down to the American Girl Doll store. And as we were standing outside and the girls were picking out um, matching jammas for their dolls and, and themselves, um, I got a phone call and at that time it was a flip phone. So I stepped outside and I opened up the flip phone and it was my brother-in-law, Matt, and, and he said, Matt, it's Kendra. Uh, I know he's there. Uh, he's gone underground. And he was a HH-60 pilot at the time. And he said, he's gone underground, but I promise you we'll do everything that we can to get him out. And I had uh, the utmost respect and faith in our special operations community that that was true. Um, but when I talk about stress and how I went completely numb in that moment, knowing uh, that I would have no way to contact him and no way really to gauge um, if he was going to get out safely or not, um, I felt every single effect of that stress throughout my entire body. And so I use that as an example. Next slide, please. Um, when we talk about stress and how it can affect us all differently, and, and sometimes it's hard when we talk about stress because it's this intangible thing, you know, oh, I'm stressed out, you know, well, what does that mean? Does it really affect us? It does. Uh, physical uh, stress, we can have faster heartbeats, as I always tease that I have right now. Um, emotional, you can become irritable, fatigued, sad, apprehensive, um, urges to cry, um, cognitively, uh, you can have difficulty concentrating, uh, difficulty making decisions. Behaviorally, sometimes we see under immense amount of stress that we act impulsively or have a tendency to self-medicate. Biologically, um, and as you guys will hear throughout this presentation, I love numbers, I love research, I love data, but biologically they've actually shown that uh, stress, prolonged stress can increase cortisol levels in bodies. And in our systems, and what does cortisol do? It can actually break down your immune system and make you ill and sick. So 
um, we need to take stress seriously. Um, it completely affects every part of ourselves and especially prolonged stress. Um, it can take a toll and impact us in a lot of different ways. So it's something again that we need to talk about and um, need to come together collectively to support each other. Next slide, please. And again, going back to my numbers and data and those out there that share the love, um, you'll appreciate this. But when I talk about normal levels of stress, uh, they're at the 84th percentile, elevated levels of stress above that 84th and clinical levels of stress at the 90th percentile. So another way that I like to explain it is um, this, <laughs> the pain scale that they always give you when you go into the doctor that kind of drives me crazy. But on a scale of zero to 10, you know, how much pain are you in? Zero being no pain at all and 10 being the most excruciating pain in the world. And so we can definitely mimic that with this saying, you know, stress a zero is that um, everything is fantastic, that you wake up at a zero, that um, you can't imagine um, anything other than the way it is, uh, you know, and, and, and that you truly don't have kind of that blanket um, of stress when you wake up in the morning. And that elevated level being at that seven or eight and clinical levels at nine or 10. So what does that look like at a nine or 10? When I talk about clinical levels of stress, if it was someone that I were to see um, in a clinic, it would, one, it would be an individual that would warrant immediate professional intervention. It's an individual that hasn't showered maybe in four days. It's an individual that when they wake up in the morning, they have to tell themselves to put their feet on the floor and to get out of bed and that it's a conscious choice because they're under such a severe blanket of stress. When we talk about clinical levels, those are the uh, individuals that uh, would need professional intervention. And so this is significant when we talk about it because those individuals aren't functioning in their daily lives and it's severe. Next slide, please. So now that we kind of talked about stress and I'm going that route um, to expand on that for you, I wanted to give you a little bit of background on me um, and why I've been so passionate about uh, stress and the effects of stress. In 2006, I transitioned out of the military. I hung up my uniform. My husband stayed in uh, and I've continued to support him as a military spouse. But I noticed a significant transition. I didn't think it was going to be that significant because I had been active duty. We'd been part of the military and we'd been living that life. But the new role I assumed as a military spouse without the active duty component, I felt an extreme amount of stress and I was surprised by it. And um, me loving research and numbers and data, I wanted to know more about it. Is this unique to me? Am I the only one feeling this way? Am I alone in the stress that I'm feeling um, being a military spouse? Or does this you know, transcend to more military spouses? Is it, is, it, is it a bigger concern or issue out there? So I had the opportunity in my master's program to look at it um, with 50 Air Force spouses, and I found some really concerning trends. But um, anything with uh, research, and especially with a small sample size of 50, I didn't know if it was unique to Valdosta, Georgia spouses, or you know, is this something more across the board um, within the military and military spouses? Uh, I had the opportunity when we moved to North Carolina to expand on the research, and I had 20 spouses that filled out psychometric evaluation of stress levels and was able to increase it to Army, Navy, and um, Air Force spouses. And what I found were those, can, those trends were confirmed. And I began speaking about it and noticed that um, this was more widespread, uh, the stress levels that I'll talk about. It was widespread across the population um, and very concerning. Next slide, please. Back one. And I, I do know that our audience out there isn't just military um, spouses and military affiliation. So although my research was in this, um, it primarily with the military population, I do want to be able to speak to um, the general population and civilians about stress as well. So I want you to kind of take a minute and visualize your close circle of friends. So those individuals would be um, ones that you pick 
phone up regularly. Um, you either get together with them, maybe not now, but you did get together with them on a regular basis. Those that you would consider within your close circle of friends. How many of those friends do you believe have significant levels of stress? And when I'm, again, when I'm talking about significant levels of stress, I'm talking about friends that you believe are struggling to get out of bed in the morning, friends that you believe um, might not be taking care of themselves, either not showering, um, not being able to function throughout their throughout the day. How many of those close circle of friends do you believe are really at those clinical levels of stress? And then can you name friends that you believe? So outside of that circle, and when you're thinking of other friends or acquaintances that you interact with, do you think that you can name individuals that are sitting at that nine or 10 at clinical levels of stress? Visualize that for a minute. Next slide, please. So what I found was the first concerning trend uh, was 27% of our military spouses report significantly high levels of stress and 20% have that higher, more clinically significant um, at that nine or 10 uh, levels of stress. One in four, according to my research of spouses could potentially be sitting out there at the clinical, at clinical levels of stress. And again, from a civilian side, this is something to also bear in mind, although my research wasn't specifically, um, didn't include civilians, um, it was military spouses. It's something that we need to consider. It's something that we need to think about is that we have potentially many, many individuals that could be sitting at clinical levels of stress. And, and are we able to really, um, by, by interactions, you know, common interactions, are we really able to assess which ones of our friends are struggling? And when I came out with these numbers and started speaking about them, what surprised me this, the most is that um, I had so many spouses come up to me afterwards and they're like, this is me, I'm there, I didn't realize it. Um, I had no idea that, in, that our stress levels were that high. I had no idea, I thought I was alone. I thought I was crazy. I heard that all the time, I thought I was crazy. And so again, even though this is based on military spouses, I want those that aren't part of the military community to consider if you start talking about it and if you start talking about clinical levels of stress and individuals struggling, how many of those friends do you believe will approach you, to, will approach others and say, you know what? It's so nice to be validated that stress is real and that it's significant and that it affects us. And so it, part of it is opening up that conversation that there is such thing as clinical levels of stress and that it can begin to break us down. When we open those doors, uh, more individuals be more apt to open up and seek help or to seek confidence in you um, if it's an acquaintance or a friend. Next slide, please. So the other question I want you guys to kind of sit and pause for a minute and think about is if you look across your sea of friends, again, can you identify your friends that you think are at the clinical levels of stress by their demographics? What is, and what do I mean by that? Um, are they uh, spouses, or friends that are older? Are they spouses, friends that are younger? Are they individuals or families that have a large amount of kids? Are they um, families that don't have any children? Are they families that move a lot or have they stayed in one place? What do you believe contributes to clinical levels of stress? And again, this was part of my research because I wanted to be able to look and see, are there certain factors or variables that influence how stressed we are? So can you, again, go back to that picture of those friends or those acquaintances that you believe could be at potentially at those clinical levels of stress do what what demographics what do they look like to you male or female next slide please so this was so hard for me as a researcher when i um started getting all the numbers in and looking at everything and i was like oh my gosh i didn't find any variables that really factor into clinical levels of stress and i was so frustrated because i really wanted to find those one or two things so i could stand up and say hey this is it this is where we really need to look at or target um, because this is increasing clinical levels of stress and i didn't find anything but when i looked at it again and really sat with the information and data 
um, it tells such an important story. And what is that story? Is that stress doesn't discriminate. Uh, so according to my research, those at clinical levels of stress, there was no difference between males and females. Um, again, branches of service, I looked at Army, Air Force, and Navy, there was no difference between that. And then some may chuckle, are there biases with this? Yes, there are. There are some that believe um, some services have less stress than others or more. Length of service, a lot of um, individuals believe that if you've been part of the military forever, uh, that certainly you don't have significant stress because you've lived this life, you've done it for 22 years, so you're able to tackle all those challenges that come forward. But what my research found was that that new military spouse to the community, there was no significant difference between clinical levels of stress of a brand new military spouse and one that had been part of the military community for 22 years. Number of children, we often think that if the individual has five children, surely they you know, are more apt to be at clinical levels of stress than those without children, but we don't know their story. So if um, someone does not have any children, maybe there are different stressors affecting them that we're not aware of. And deployment time, again, being part of um, a special ops community, I certainly thought um, more deployment time would um, show us more clinical levels of stress. And um, this was a funny one, because um, when I looked at it, I had them indicate how many months out of um, two years that the active duty member had been out of the house. And this was both for training time deployments and TDYs. And um, there was no significant difference between those active duty members that had been home for a total of all 24 months and those that had been gone for 24 months. And so I was chatting with my husband when that one first came through and he's like, how is that true? And, and I chuckled and I looked at him and I said, you don't think sometimes when you're home for a long period of time that it's just as stressful, but it brings up, you know, a, a common understanding that there are certain biases that we that we hold that we don't even know we hold. And so in a civilian you know, community, what biases do we have? Or do we think that um, if someone is employed in a certain job that they're gonna have higher um, incidence of clinical stress? Or do we think if someone's not employed um, that they are more stressed or, or aren't? Um, I think it, again, drives that conversation or maybe that personal reflection to sit down and those friends that you interact with and acquaintances um, to let those biases go, uh, that you may assume that certain friends have it all together, that they appear um, to have everything in order and all things organized and functioning extremely well, but have you, you know, taken that opportunity to really sit down and listen and ask how they're doing and not just ask in a, how are you doing um, and move on in the conversation, but how are you really doing? And so this, this tells us such important things that um, oftentimes we carry those biases associated with those that should and should not um, be at clinical levels of stress. And the more, again, that we talk about it, uh, the more um, we'll be apt to help those individuals that are afraid to stand up and say, you know, this is me and this is how I'm feeling. And the other part of it, especially today, um, is that living with stress has been normalized. So with COVID-19, uh, this is something that I've heard so much is, well, everybody's doing it. Um, you, you shouldn't, um, shouldn't, and couldn't, I hear a lot. Um, be complain because everybody's virtually um, uh, homeschooling or um, all the teachers are going through this as school districts or there are so many parents that are struggling you know trying to find child care for their children so you know don't complain um, about your stress levels because everybody's everybody's doing it and when we say things like that we really minimize that individual struggle because i'll be honest with you it is a hard environment but i have no idea what someone else's personal struggle is and if their unique situation although it may look and that they they shouldn't have as significant stress as others we don't know we don't know if they do so um comments like that certainly are um, floating around and and we need to caution with that because it's minimizing um individuals that might really be struggling. Can we move to the next slide, please? 
And a question just came in, which um, I love is, how do you build optimism and positive emotions when you're stressed and overwhelmed and can't see the light? And we'll definitely go into that towards um, a little bit later into the um, presentation about rational behavioral therapy. And that's really um, you, my foundation in self-help tools that we can um, certainly do um, to help ourselves have more of that positive outcome instead of kind of seeing the um, doomsday all day long. It, it, we can reshape our own thoughts that can help. And great question. I'll go into that a little bit um, later in the presentation. So stress as a constant, stress comes in many different sizes, shapes, and colors and affects us all differently. You'll never fully understand someone else's stress. Um, what do I mean by that? Um, I use the typical examples or the red flags that we often talk about when we think someone's stressed, those that are isolating, right? That's a red flag if you hear that a lot. They're isolating, they're not seeing anyone, they're staying in their home, that's a red flag. Uh, they haven't showered, you know, again, those things I mentioned, they're not caring for themselves, they're not caring for their children. Um, those are certainly red flags that an individual is at clinical levels of stress. But what about the, the other individuals? And I use this one as an example. What about that individual that packs their schedule? And when I say packs their schedule, if you looked at their you know, outlook or their personal planner, that they do not have 10 minutes to themselves. What about that individual? Um, is that, could that person possibly get clinical levels of stress? And I would argue that they could be because it's a coping skill for them to be so busy that they literally do not have time for that self-reflection or that thought because they don't want to sit down with themselves and really digest how they're feeling or what they're struggling with. And so they overpack their schedule. And I've seen this a lot is um, individuals that are at clinical levels of stress they're functioning, they're out, they're doing so many things, but when you ask them to stop, uh, that's a very different person because they're alone with themselves and alone with their thoughts, and you'll see that they're truly struggling. So that is something that I also want us just to be aware with going out and with our friends and our acquaintances and colleagues and peers, is that be open and aware that stress can look different on all of us. Don't make those assumptions that the only person that's stressed is the one that's isolating. It's those big red flags. Are the red flags still legitimate? Absolutely. But be open um, to, to seeing stress through another lens and another perspective that um, individuals might exhibit different behaviors when they're at those clinical levels of stress. Next slide, please. Oh, great question. Please provide examples of healthy stress versus unhealthy stress. What other healthy activities like exercise, meditation, prayer, social connection, positive thinking, and behavior modifications can help? And again, I'll go into that in just a little bit. Um, healthy stress. So there's, um, we look at, there are different outcomes from stress. We have those that can have a positive outcome from stress. Those can have like a neutral outcome to stress and those that can have a negative effect of stress. And what does that mean? So there's um, individuals that when placed under stress, we often say they rise to the occasion. They're able to accomplish a lot of things. It, um, it forces them to dig deep and um, they're, they're able to perform under that healthy stress. Uh, the neutral stress is kind of taking it, having that self-talk, I can do this. And those that really can't handle it. And so when we say unhealthy stress is when they begin to break down, when that individual begins to break down and can no longer function. And so that really is kind of the difference between um, is that individual able to go throughout their daily lives and function or are they not? And so that's that, that negative effect is when they are no longer able to function in a daily routine. Um, but it's a great point is that there is healthy stress. Uh, stress and indoctrination is a big part of the military is where we place physical, mental um, stress on our active duty members to see how they can respond and how they can perform under healthy stress. 
And so it's, it's definitely a tool in which individuals can see what their limitations are and grow from it, but we need to be very cautious. And so when is it unhealthy? Again, is when we start to see those effects in one of those areas, physical decline, cognitive decline, behaviors that I talked about, self-medicating, um, when we start to see effects on our immune system, that's when we're having that unhealthy or that negative effect of stress. And what are some other coping skills? Again, I'll go into that in just a little bit of something that I talk about a lot is that rational behavioral therapy. Um, but there are so many activities to help. Um, exercise, again, is a great example. Meditation, prayer, all the things that you brought up in the comments are fantastic. One that I love is social connection. Um, I think knowing that someone in having that person that you know you can always reach out to and I always um, I have an individual that I'm always close with and I always say that's that it's not necessarily that I call them every single day but I know if I needed to that it'd be someone that I could call at any time at any moment and they would pick up the phone so having that person as a connection and a support system is so important um, as as a coping skill or a tool uh, when you're under a lot of stress so why is this important um, from a military perspective um, we had in 2019, the Department of Defense just started tracking for the first time military spouse suicides. And in 2017, there was 123 spouses that lost their lives to suicide. And it's one is too many. And so this is something that um, is not going away, that it's increasing. And, and from a civilian side or general population, on average, 132 Americans die by suicide each day. Uh, one in four million Americans attempted suicide, and this was according to um, the CDC data. So um, again, it's something that we need to be talking about. It's something that we need to open the doors and communicate about because when we isolate or when we stuff down those feelings and we don't talk about how we're feeling, um, this is when serious problems arise. And so um, for both military and for civilians, talk about it. Um, talk about how stress affects us. Talk about how it's significant and how it's impacting you. And you'd be surprised, the more you open up, I promise you the more people will reach back and say, I feel the same way, I'm struggling too. And another comment that just came through, which is awesome, is especially now with COVID, um, it, it's so important and we've been really creative and I um, just love uh, how, a lot of our in the in the military side and our military spouses, I could talk about them all day all day long. I think they're amazing. I'm biased, obviously, but they've been so creative in COVID, setting up virtual coffees and um, virtual book clubs and ways to get together when we can't physically be together. And that's one thing that I've talked about a lot. Is although COVID has forced us to be physically disconnected. Um, we should try even harder to be socially connected and emotionally connected. Does it require more effort and more en mental energy? Yes, I don't think I've been this mentally exhausted in a very long time just because of the conscious choice I have to make often um, for those connections to stay emotionally and, and socially connected with family members, with friends. And so it is a conscious choice and something that um, we definitely has placed a new stress and a new demand on us now um, that it's that it's a, a proactive choice to make sure that we're still taking care of that part of ourselves. What can we do uh, to help each other? So um, again, as I was going out and talking about um, a lot of the stress, I had a lot of spouses come up afterwards and they're like, great. Dr. Lowe, you're telling us that we're at clinical levels of stress. I agree. I'm not crazy. This is good. I'm not alone. But now what? And, and that's something kind of that's been coming up in the, in the post as well is now what? So we're at these clinical levels of stress. We're in an unusual time where so much stress is being placed on us from a lot of different, a lot of different areas and, and COVID um, really forcing us um, to step outside our comfort zones. Now what? What do we do with this? Do we just take on the weight now that this many people could be at clinical levels of stress and that we have suicide increasing and attempts of suicide? Um, so I went back and I said, I really want um, to provide a resource, something that is tangible, something that you can work on yourselves or um, with a group 
essentially with a group of friends. So you'll see um, at the bottom, it's wake up, kick ass, repeat. And I have to offer, I get a lot of um, reactions to the title of the book and you know what's with the title of the book and um, those that either absolutely love it, a few that hate it. Um, but I have a story behind it and that gives you a little bit of uh, context to why uh, I'm so partial to the title of the book. Um, in 2015, we received orders um, to go to Okinawa, Japan. You can see my little samurai. Oh, you can't because you can see the um, slide presentation. I'm my samurai man in the back. And I was so excited. It was a two-year assignment. Um, it was a chance to immerse myself in a new culture. It was an adventure. It was it, being able to expose my children to a culture that in, in any other situation, they never would have that chance. So um, we boarded the plane in Seattle, Washington. And I don't know if anybody out there has ever been on the Patriot Express. It's a military um, transportation to go overseas. And so it's a whole bunch of military families all being uprooted, um, moving overseas. And it was 36 hours of travel with a two-year-old, a three-year-old, and a five-year-old at the time uh, that was completely heinous. And to say I was exhausted when we landed um, doesn't even begin to um, express how I felt when I got off that plane uh, on the Patriot Express. They, at the time, we didn't have individual um, TVs in the back of the seat. So uh, there was one movie displayed that my kids weren't had no interest in at all. And I'll never forget, we had um, wiki sticks. I don't know if anybody's ever seen those are little sticks for kids. And I told myself, and we played with them for hours. If I ever saw another wiki stick after that travel, um, I was going to lose it. So we got off the plane and we landed at Kadena Air Base. And we had such an amazing warm welcome um, by my husband's new squadron and they were all there and had signs and banners and we all hopped in little Okinawa cars and drove across the base um, to our new house and I was so excited for this two-year adventure and we got into the house and um, it's pretty much what I refer to as a cinder block so we have a lot of we had a lot of typhoons in Okinawa and so they built um, the houses to withstand anything pretty much everything so you're in a cinder block and um, I walked in and it was a little hard to digest at first, but again, I told myself, I'm so excited for this two years. It's an adventure. It's a chance to immerse myself in this amazing culture and um, expose my children. I'm so excited. So I stood over by the 1970s shutters in the corner and my husband's new boss's wife um, stepped over and she's like, you know, we're so glad you're here and we just, we're just so glad. And I know it's a long travel and the kids and, you know, we have food and kind of telling me what they put in the house, which was awesome. And um, she's kind of rambling on. I half hear her because again, I'm exhausted after travel. And she's like, yeah, yeah. And, you know, and we're just thrilled that you guys are going to be here four years. And I stopped and I said four years and she's like yeah yeah we you guys are going to be here four years um we just found out about it and my stomach just dropped and my husband probably seeing the physical effects of that news um, from across the room kind of gave me an odd look and um just said thank you so much everyone I think uh I think we're tired and we and it's time to go and so we shuffled them all out the door and as we laid down that night he looked at me and he said, um, and I said to him, are you serious? Four years? And he said, yeah, it's four years. And, and it shifted in me. Something completely shifted. Um, four years became a lifetime to me. Four years became a time in which uh, my children didn't have hardly any contact with their grandparents. Four years was a time in which I lost all three of my grandparents, uh, remaining grandparents, and I couldn't travel back for funerals. And so to say I struggled is an understatement. And December rolled around and my husband kind of looked at me and he said, you know what? He's like, I know you're struggling, but you got to find a way to get your head in the game. And I'm like, I know, I know I got to find a way. And so I tried exercise and journaling a lot of those um, things that we talk about and nothing was working. And so I saw an email come in and across um, on wall words, you know, i wanted to pick out something to put on my wall to kind of motivate me. It was love, laughter, joy, all these things. And I'm like, oh, this just doesn't fit. And so then I saw it wake up, kick ass, repeat. And 
I ordered it in the largest, darkest print that I could imagine and slapped it right up on my wall. And if you can click to the next slide. I put it up uh, right above those 1970 shutters and for four years it stayed up there just as a visual, tangible reminder that we can do anything, that you can shift your mindset, you can shift your frame of reference and you can, you're capable of doing anything. And so um, this stayed up and as new neighbors made it into the um, neighborhood and stopped by, I'd often forget it was there and they look up at the wall and I'd kind of chuckle, it's my motivation tool. And then as my children learned to read um, and um, reported to their teachers that their mom had asked on the wall, I had to do some explaining for that. But um, I, I really um, had, to have this. This was something that I had to have to help me through that personal struggle. And so when I was writing the book as a resource and tool, um, that's a background for it. It's to tell all of us that yes, our struggles are real. Yes, um, you could be right now at clinical levels of stress, but you can, you can wake up, you can make a choice, you can choose um, positive things to help with where you're at. And um, that's really why um, the cover of the book is what it is. Next slide, please. So what is it? Um, yes, it's, it has a lot of information on military families, but I've had many outside of the community read it as well because it's an eight-week study that you can go through together. There are stories from about 30 spouses that share their personal um, struggles with stress and with the military life. It has, um, as I mentioned, lots of um, statistics and data, not too much, um, but I love it, so I had to put it in there. And then reflection questions, exercises, and tangible tools. And so it's, again, a self-help tool if you are struggling, but if you're not, it's also a fantastic tool because you can gain some of those tools that you might need at some point in your life that you don't think you need right now. The theoretical premise, as I talked about, is rational behavioral therapy. Um, it's a self-help um, to build a rational view of the world. And again, the secondary effect is really building social connections and peer support if you go through it together. Um, Next slide, please. So what do you think you're experiencing right now? Do you, I want you to kind of read through these again. Are you experiencing any of these things going through COVID right now in 2020? It's just been a bear of a year. Um, do you notice any of these markers of stress yourself? And I want you, if you do, write them down. Write them down right now if you're starting to notice some of these things. Next slide. If you highlighted several of the symptoms, then it's a strong possibility you might be experiencing social emotional distress. So what is distress? When you become, you begin to feel overwhelmed by events or circumstances. Are you at that point? Do you feel overwhelmed? And then what now? What do we do with that if you are? Next slide, please. So I love this, the ABC theory of emotions. It's how you create your emotions, how they are experienced and how you can change, how you feel and how you behave by making specific changes to your thinking. And I get a lot of pushback sometimes with this is, are you serious? By just telling myself certain things, I can start to feel better. And it is, we forget how strong and powerful our minds are. And I use this as an example all the time. I get up early and I exercise at five o'clock and every single morning, my mind is a powerful tool. It says, oh, Kendra, you can work out tomorrow. You just 10 more minutes, you can sleep. Oh, your knee kind of hurts. The weather just came in and your knee's kind of sore. Maybe you should take the day off. Your mind is extremely powerful and extremely influential on the choices that we make, the behaviors that we have and our outlooks and our feelings and emotions. So um, yes, is your mind that powerful of a tool? It is. Next slide, please. So I use kind of this scenario right now. I work in a school district and I had a teacher approach me and I'll kind of summarize um, just feeling totally overwhelmed. Um, the minute, you know, she was saying that the minute she felt like she got on top of one thing, another thing was demanded. And then they bring in a few students back and that poses new challenges. Now they have to teach virtually and in person. And she wasn't sleeping. She wasn't eating. 
um, she was isolating from friends and family and she just, you know, looked at me and in tears, she said, I don't know how long I can sustain this. I don't know if what's being expected of me right now, I don't know if I can sustain this. And I think that's really true of what a lot of us are going through right now is that we're juggling it, we're doing okay. Um, we don't know how long it's gonna last, which takes a lot of control away from us. And when we take that control away from us, it's hard to walk ourselves through our thoughts and how they're really changing um, how we behave and our feelings. Next slide, please. So it's perception. Um, and I used, again, going back to the teacher example, she, you know, she said, I don't know if I can handle everything that's required of me right now. She thought and she believed, I don't know how long I can sustain this. And it drove her emotions. And as a result, she was thinking she couldn't handle one more thing. And it made her feel alone. It made her feel isolated. Uh, it made her feel as though she couldn't accomplish anything and she was not succeeding. And that's hard when we feel like we're not succeeding in our jobs, personally, professionally, that's hard. So the rational part of it is recognize how you make yourself feel the way you do. Choose to change your emotions to make yourself feel differently without having to change the situation. We have no control over COVID. We have no control in the military, whether we get moved again or whether um, the active duty member deploys, we cannot change the situation, but we can change the what we think about it, how we feel about it, emotions which then drive our behaviors. Next slide, please. So what do we do to prevent? Have systematic, tangible tools readily available. Why? Because it's super hard to locate those tools when you're already worn down and broken. When you're in that place, it's hard to reach out. It's hard to find a new tool because you're already struggling and you're, um, you're, you're in that moment and it's really hard to pull yourself out. So work through um, emotional responses systematically. And again, my resource goes into way depth and I'm just giving you guys a little bit of a glimpse. But again, that part is that perception. You perceive something you think and believe. The emotions are feelings as a result. They lead you to your actions and all of our actions do have natural consequences or results. Next slide, please. So your choice really is right here. Positive thoughts, negative thoughts, neutral thoughts. And a great tool that you all can start today is just journaling. What's the first two thoughts you have in the morning? Is it, oh my gosh, how many days till Friday? I don't know if I can make it till Friday. Or is it, you know what? I, I made it through Monday. I'm excited about something on the weekend. Pick something. What are those thoughts? Do you, do you yourself have a lot of positive thoughts? Do you have a lot of negative thoughts or are they neutral thoughts? Where are you at right now? And the really the only way to do that is to sit down, take that moment with yourself, have that reflection of what is going through your head and through your mind on a daily basis. Because we know that what's in those thoughts that are circling constantly, those drive everything else throughout our day. Next slide. So positive thoughts about COVID um, creates positive feelings and lets you take charge. I have had challenges before in education, and this is what I told her, I, you know, shift it. I can do this again. Positive thoughts lead to proactive actions, making lists of things you want to accomplish, planning monthly rewards. You know what? I made it through. I remember when this started in March, and we used to do fun Fridays. Um, with my kiddos and every Friday they would they had everything done and we would just take a break from everything and have and we would celebrate we made it through another week of COVID we made it through another week of challenges and when you have that positive thought about it and you um, tell yourselves that you are accomplishing something that you've never done before it leads to having those moments of celebration and having those um, positive actions that come out of it. Negative thoughts. This is the worst thing that's ever happened to me. I will never be able to do this for a prolong, prolonged time. Awfulizing the situation often leads to resentment. So this is something that we're seeing in the school district is really awfulizing it. A lot of resentment towards administration staff pulling away from family and friends and self-medicating. Um, when you have, when you awfulize it, make it the worst thing ever, your actions will lead to that. You're going to have a hard time seeing a way out of it because 
you have such negative thoughts about what's going on. Is it hard? Absolutely. Is it tough? Is it something that's never been required of us? Yes. Can you do it? Yes, you can find a way to do it. And so again, working with that teacher saying, this isn't the worst thing. Think back in your life. I'm sure you can tell me one or two things that has been worse than this that you've overcome. You can, you can do it. It just doesn't feel like it right now. Neutral thoughts. We can be neutral sometimes too. Can they, can it benefit? It is. I know this is going to be hard, but I will find a way through this new challenge. So we have those that are, you know, positive and I'm conquering the world, but you, it can be neutral. It can be, you know what, this is super tough. Um, I'm going to have to try harder than I ever have in my life. Um, but I can find a way through those neutral thoughts can also lead to positive um, coping skills that we talked about, exercise routines, counseling support, reaching out to friends, journaling, finding creative ways to help your students in the school district. Uh, being neutral to it is okay. It's okay to be neutral. The negative is what really causes us, um, and we see those effects in all those different areas as those negative thoughts. Next slide, please. Attitudes, what we believe so strongly we don't have time to think before we react to the situation. Um, automatically formed attitudes are significant and we see this. Um, you have to increase your awareness and again it's that self, that time with yourself. Do you have underlying attitudes about certain things? I am so furious that you know our kids are not in school or they are in school or they are forcing us to do this or that or oh my gosh how many surveys we've filled out. Attitudes are the result of habitually pairing that ABC pattern. It's when it's something automatic. We automatically, it shifts the way we view in our lens of everything that we're being exposed to, all our experiences, and increased awareness. We need to find out, do you have underlying attitudes? Um, next slide, please. Again, what are some unpleasant feelings that um, we often see the irrational attitudes, there's one, you know, and I'll go, you guys can read, um, but I'll go through the one example of depression. I can't do this anymore. It's hopeless. Nothing will ever change. COVID is awful. That's the irrational attitude. The rational attitude is you can do far more than you think. There's always hope. And the COVID environment has positive and negative aspects. There are many amazing things that have come out of this trying time. Focus on that. I've had dinner with my family together almost every single night since COVID. That's amazing. Um, it's forced us to slow down. So rationalize what you're thinking. Is it, is it a rational attitude or is it irrational? And then looking again towards the other side of the chart is your desirable feeling. We want to feel calm. We want to feel concerned. Can we feel disappointment? Is that desirable? Disappointment's okay. Hope. Hope is a wonderful thing. So I ask you to kind of look at that unpleasant feeling. Are you feeling any of those right now? Then write down what that attitude is. What is that thought that you're having? Try to shift it. If you're angry, it's not fair. Well, you know, the, the world is not always fair. I don't like it, so I will do what? Yes, someone just said positive self-talk. Hope with COVID, 99.94 survivability rate of COVID. Yes, that's rational. That's rational is knowing the statistics and knowing the data. Are we still fearful? Yes, we can be. Is it still a lot that's being asked of us? It is, but rationalize through it with facts and data and with positive thoughts of what the positive things that are that come out of it and positive ways that you can affect change and change your lens. Next slide, please. I know I'm getting close on time. I was going to go through all of them, but I'm getting close on time and I want you to have a chance to ask questions. Unpleasant feelings, depression, hurt. These are just an awesome, awesome daily script. If you want to screenshot it, um, that helps. And again, I had someone come back and you're saying, so if you tell me, if I read this a couple times a day that it's actually going to change, going back to my original point, yes, your mind is so powerful. If you read this to yourself and say, what I do does not change me. Sometimes I make mistakes and sometimes I do things very well, but I'm the same person no matter what I do. If you read through one of these daily scripts multiple times a day, it does begin to shift. It shifts those 
thoughts to more positive thoughts. It shifts those emotions to more positive emotions. It shifts those behaviors to more positive behaviors. So these are great scripts and they're just an, a quick example, um, but a great way that if you need something, the first thing when you wake up in the morning and you're having some of those negative thoughts trickle in, read this instead, force those negative thoughts out, replace them with positive daily scripts that you can do amazing things and that you can wake up and kick some butt today. Next slide, please. You, it often seems like we have little control over what happens. You can, can take control of your attitudes and emotions. You always have a choice. Uh, don't have to change the event. Um, you have the choice to change you and our thoughts and our attitudes really do drive our emotions. Next slide. This is my contact information. Again, I wanted to leave you guys a little bit of a uh, chance to ask some questions if you wanted to, but um, please reach out uh, anytime I get a chance, as I said in the beginning, to talk about this, to share my stories, to share stories of other military spouses and other individuals, um, colleagues, coworkers that I've um, that are willing to share their stories. I, I think it's so important. The more we continue to have this conversation, the more those individuals that might be sitting out there alone, thinking that they're the only ones, um, they won't be alone anymore. They'll be more open to discussing their challenges. They'll be more opening, open to receive help. And that's truly what we want is to bridge that gap. So those that are sitting there thinking that they have no resources, no outlet, they do. They do have it and they'll be more apt to actually utilize those resources and, and get the help that they might need. Is there any questions? I'm looking at the um, comment chat. Um, how do we fight our, oh yes, go ahead. I'm sorry, this is Michelle Lesson. Um, I'm facilitating QA and um, Q&A and there are two comments in our chat box I'd like to bring to your attention, if I may. Please. Oh, someone has said part of the barrier of seeking help is how military care tends to treat spouses who do ask for help. There's a culture of minimizing and thinking spouses are exaggerating. Would you please speak to that? Oh, I love that question. I get it every time. Can I speak to it? Yes, I will speak to it every single day if I get a chance to and given the opportunity. Um, simply by um, me doing these presentations to increase awareness and I've had opportunities to talk to leadership because we need to remove that stigmatism. Are we doing better at it in the military? Yes, we're doing better at it. Are we great and perfect at it yet? No, we're not. Do that, does the stigmatism still exist with mental health? It does. But again, I, I challenge you to take that risk. I challenge you to step out and say, it's okay. Um, mental health is just as important as physical health meaning we get a physical every single year to make sure our bodies are functioning properly. Why not start a culture in which we get a mental check once a year that you have a counselor that you touch base with once a year just to do a mental, mental health checkup, tune-up. Um, maybe there's new things that, that have come out in the last year. Psychology is always emerging uh, with new tools and um, new tool sets that we can use. So why not do that mental health check-in once a year and then talk to people about it? Say, yeah, I got my physical this year. I got my mental health check this year. I'm tuned up. Talk about it more. Be that person that does seek, seek counseling. Uh, the more that we say it's okay and as a community talk about it and say, yeah, I have a counselor. I see a counselor. Our family does. We're in family therapy. Uh, the more we talk about it, it does start to break down those barriers that we still have, saying that mental health, that there's something wrong. Uh, it's not, it could be just, I am working on it. I'm trying to find ways to improve. And I think that's awesome. People are trying to find new tools or ways to improve because if we're not, then we're simply saying we're perfect the way we are. And we know that there's no such thing as that. Um, so there's always room for improvement. And I think um, talking more about it being that individual to take the risk and be a leader and say, uh, have you had your mental health check this year? Well, what does that mean? Hey, I think we should do it. Um, that is what evokes change is when we take those risks and we step out and say, and be the voice to say, it's okay. It's okay. We all should have an opportunity to grow um, and to build a stronger emotional and social health. Thank you. Somebody else says, 
Living in San Antonio, which is known as Military Town USA, probably over 80% of my close friends are military, and I do know many that are struggling with high levels of stress and or PTSD, including their spouses and older children. Would you please address that? Yeah, uh, P um, PTSD is something that um, is definitely significant um, within the military community. Um, there's a lot that we endure. There's a lot that active duty members endure. And um, there's, oh gosh, I could talk on this for hours and I'm gonna try to summarize and probably do a bad job, but it is, it is something. And that's why I did the research is because I noticed the significant amount of stress that our spouses are feeling and that it is rampant. And so is, is it something that continues to be present in the population? Absolutely. But mm -hmm it's again going back to the more we talk about it the more we come together support each other the more we encourage each other to seek out resources and counseling and support that's what begins to help um the active duty side yes i would love to do research on the active duty they haven't let me do it yet um but if they did i would love to be able to reflect and show how significant theirs is as well um, from a different standpoint, because I think it does um, impact the entire family when the active duty member struggles with things such as you mentioned, depression, PTSD. Um, it's another layer of stress for that military spouse and the family as well. Thank you. Dr. Lowe, how do we fight our own cognitive traps while trying to apply this newer way of thinking that you've shared with us? put it on paper. So again, your mind's going to play tricks on you all the time. Write it down. Um, I'm such a visual learner. Uh, and I, and I think there's something to be said for the, uh, the actual physical tangible part of writing it down. So write down those positive affirmations, get a journal, write down three things. Another thing that um, came up in a zoom meeting that I was in is at the end of the day, write down three positive things about your day, but don't just sit and say it and well, this happened, this, and list it, write them down. Write down three amazing things that happened. In, and when I say amazing things, it could be that you took a shower. It could be that you finally washed your hair. It could be that you finished the laundry that's been stacked up. Write down three things that you did awesome that day. And then it's in a journal because when you're having a rough day or you're falling prey to those cognitive traps again, go back and read back. And it's like, yeah, today's hard. I'm feeling some of those negative thoughts creep in, but look at these um, positive things I've done all week long. I forgot that I finished um, that quilt that I wanted to do. I forgot that I submitted that presentation that I wanted to finish, that I had that special moment with my seven-year-old that she shared with me her personal feelings. That's a win. I forgot that we had that conversation and it was amazing. And we had a moment together um, as a bond, as a parent and child, write those things down. So when those cognitive traps come up, and yes, they do because our mind is strong, read them back and tell yourself, I did these amazing things. Look at everything I did this week and I am doing great. Even though I don't feel like it right now, it doesn't seem like it right now. I might not be telling myself that right now, but go back because what is that? That's rational. That's data for you to go back and say, yes, I am. I'm still getting stuff done. I'm still doing great. Thanks. The last question in the chat box is, do you have any material or programs for the addiction community? Because that ties directly into the military folks who struggle with PTSD that contributes to addiction. No, I'm sorry, I don't, not specifically for addiction. So um, that is uh, uh, not uh, my area of expertise, um, but it's definitely um, an area that needs to be addressed. And there are individuals, um, if I, I'll probably, if I can follow up with that person, if someone can write it down, I can get you some contacts if you want it um, specifically. Um, but that's not my area of expertise. <laughs> Thank you. There are no more questions in the chat box. Well, I, again, I um, can't thank you guys enough for allowing me the opportunity to share my story, share my path, um, share uh, where I am today. And uh, again, hoping that um, out of this, that you all, my wish and my challenge to you is um, talk about it. Talk about stress. Uh, talk about how you feel. Reach out to friends. Um, make it a more common part of our daily dialogue because by doing that, um, it allows other individuals that feel alone 
uh, that opportunity and that chance to open up with you. So I challenge you to step out and do that. And um, again, I'm uh, easy to find. I have my contact information. So please reach out um, if you have any questions or comments or um, just want to chat. <laughs> Miss Kendra, thank you. Thank you so much. That was amazing. And what I find also awesome is even though I've heard you speak before, each time I'm here, I hear something new. Um, and so thank you once again for taking the time out of your insanely busy day as well to present for us. Just so you know, we can see the little samurai. It's like kind of pin you good. In your head. <laughs> yeah. um, He's, so, he's, he looks nice in the den, but when we were in Okinawa and in, he was in our bedroom for three months prior to moving back to the States, I used to wake up and see that every single morning um, and it terrorized <laughs> me. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> All right. Um, if we get any more questions for you, we will get them to you via email. And I did want to formally announce, I can't believe I forgot to have Miss Kirsten announce this in the beginning. We are going to... I don't know if raffle is the right word, but we're giving away four um, of Wake Up, Wake Up Kick-Ass Repeat books. Um, two people, we're gonna select among the folks who complete the post symposium survey. So if you did not register, that means we don't have your email to send it to you. So if you did not, sorry, my cat's trying to crawl in my lap. <laughs> Ridiculous. If you did not register, please um, email us at our email address and we'll put it in the chat so that we can um, get the survey to you and then you can win one of those books, maybe possibly. If not, um, we will get you to the link if you'd like one in Amazon. All right, do we have anything else before we take a short break before Miss Christy comes on up? Now, I think we're good. Thank you, Dr. Lowe. Your presentation was a good reminder. I've already got your book in my Amazon cart, so if I don't win one, I'm getting it one way or another. <laughs> uh, thank you all. Um, truly, uh, it was my pleasure and um, just um, enjoyed it. So, thank you. Thanks. All right, we'll go ahead and go to um, our break. We will start with Miss Kristen Christie with exclamation um, right at the um, half hour. I am going to attempt to play music. Uh, <laughs> if it doesn't work, you can make fun of me all you want. That's okay. Um, but I will try. Um, and I just chose a calming music for relaxation. So uh, feel free to step away, stretch, do whatever. Wanted to ask Miss Jennifer if you have a quick um, self care break for us this time or no, before I move on. I do, if we have time. Okay, go for it. We have self care stuff to do. I got a whole list. All right. It drives my kids crazy, but um, I practice on them a lot. <laughs> um, okay, so we're going to do a breathing exercise right now. It should only take a minute. Um, there's a lot of different breathing exercises that are out there, um, depending on where you look or who you go to. The one I like to practice, it's called four, seven, eight breathing, and you're going to look ridiculous. So just go ahead and get that out of the way now. Um, you can keep your, your screens off. So the only one that you're going to see looking ridiculous is going to be me. So, um, to practice the four, seven, eight breathing, Again, like we did before, you wanna find a comfortable place to sit or lie down. Re, don't fall asleep, please. Um, so be sure you always practice good posture, especially when you're doing breathing exercises. So um, it helps kind of open up your diaphragm and give you room to really breathe deep. Um, so sit tall. Um, to prepare this, it's gonna sound a little funny, but um, you want to take the tip of your tongue and you want to rest it against the roof of your mouth right behind your front teeth. So all the way up. It doesn't, don't, doesn't have to be strong. Like you don't have to push with force, but just push your tongue up um, to, so it's touching the inside of your front teeth. Um, try to keep your tongue in, in place throughout the breathing exercise. If, it, if you forget and, and it goes away, just bring it back when you remember um, so we're going to do an, um, 
It's going to, so it's called four, seven, eight. So you're going to inhale for four seconds or for, for a count of four that you're going to do in your head. You're going to hold it for seven seconds and then we're going to exhale for eight. So it's four, seven, eight. Okay. So we're, when you do this in practice, you should do it really about four times is the average of what I normally do it. Okay. So first let your lips part, relax your jaw. When you exhale out of your mouth, I want you to make this whooshing sound. That's, this is the ridiculous part of it. So when I exhale, it's going to be like a... So you're going to hear it and you're going to see it. When we breathe in, we're breathing in through our nose and out through our mouth. Okay? So let's try this. Let your lips fall apart. Exhale first to get out everything you have in here. Close your lips slightly and inhale through your nose as you count to four in your head. Hold for seven seconds. And when you exhale for eight, all of it, all of it. When you inhale, do your inhale for four. Hold again. <sighs> Slowly inhale. If your count is different than mine, that's okay. Seven seconds is different when you're holding your breath. When you finish your last exhale, I want you to breathe lightly, slowly, normally, not deep, relaxing. So this breathing technique should not necessarily only be practiced when you're stressed or only when you're relaxed, but I like to do it a couple times a day throughout the day so that when I need to to use it as my go-to, it's just a lot easier. My brain goes through it a lot quicker and I don't have to think about the counting. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be used to fall asleep, right? But it can put you in this deep state of relaxation. So then we go back to our mindfulness exercise from before and it kind of brings us in our present to allow us to think about what it is that we're dealing with in that moment. Um, thank you. I hope that helps. Awesome. And I did not fall asleep. Yes. Good. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so we're going to go ahead and, whoa, um, we're going to go ahead and take a break here. Um, we will have Miss Kristen Christie up at, well, in six minutes. So um, run to the restroom, refill your coffee, stretch, do whatever you want to do, and we will see you back in a few minutes. Get my participant screen up here. All right, so up next we have, um, where's Kirsten? Is she here? I'm here. There she me? is. Okay, yes. I'm going to go ahead and prepare. Um, Miss Christie is going to do her own slides, but I'm going to prepare them in the background just in case. So that's what I'm letting you. Take it away. <laughs> All right. Are you, do you need a minute, Ree, or are you good? No, you go ahead. Okay. All right. Well, welcome back, everyone. Thank you so much um, for following along with us today. Thank you to all our presenters so far, and I hope that, or we all hope that you were able um, to take a little break and uh, regroup or refresh whatever you need to do. Um, our next presenter, Ms. Kristen Christie, is here. And I see your beautiful face, Ms. Kristen. Um, are you able to hear me okay? Yes, ma'am. Great, wonderful. Well, if you are set and ready to go, I am gonna turn the floor over to you. Great, thank you. 
have you all ever heard a saying and it just was an aha moment? For me, the aha moment was a saying by Vernon Law, the athlete, when he said, life is a tough teacher. We get the test first and then we learn the lesson. It, it was an aha moment for me. And I think each of you can think about an event in your life that really truly was a test, whether it was a, a pop quiz, a midterm or a final. And then you learn lessons from, from those tests. And today I'm just gonna tell you about a few of the tests that I've gone through and the lessons that I've learned. And hopefully something will resonate with, with you um, about our story. And I have to admit that telling our story is healing uh, for me personally. So thank you for the opportunity to, to do a little bit of healing today. I grew up in the Air Force. My dad was in the Air Force for 32 years and we were blessed to be able to move all over the world. Now, typically our move was every two years and that was a lot, but I'm an uber extrovert. I've always been an uber extrovert and I know that I can walk into a room and suck the air right out of an introvert's lungs if I'm not careful. But to me, moving was just another adventure. And we were fortunate enough to live overseas as well as um, in the United States. But two mantras that my younger brother and I had growing up from my parents, from our parents, um, the first one was, if you don't ask, the answer is always no. If you ask, you have a chance. If you have a chance, take it. And if it changes your life, let it. And we have followed that throughout our lives. The other one was we got embedded in our community. Moving every two years, we had a lot of communities to get embedded in, but getting embedded and becoming part of that community was so vitally important for us because that community came alongside of us after those really tough tests that we've had in life. So in the few minutes that I've been talking, I said the word community a number of times. And I guarantee you that my definition of community is different than each and every one of yours. So when I talk about community, think about your community. Is that your neighborhood? Is that your office? Is that your kid's school? Um, how about a Texas Hold'em group or a Bunko group or you know, just getting together with, for a virtual cocktail hour or happy hour, whatever your community looks like. Think about that community. In 1983, I was 15 years old, a junior in high school, and we had just moved back to Germany, to Wiesbaden, Germany. And um, we really enjoyed living overseas and being back uh, in, in that community. Now, the community members were different. That's the beauty of the Air Force and, and the military in general. It's, uh, it's that dandelion, um, uh, what we talk about the dandelion, when the wind takes it, you know, we go all over and we bloom where we're planted. But uh, in 1983, we were back in Germany. I was a junior in high school. Uh, I told you I was an uber extrovert and I'm very competitive. <laughs> I will tell you that. And uh, I was an athlete. Even moving, I was playing world-class athletes. Um, in October of 1983, I played Steffi Graf. She was 14 and I was 15 years old. She was 98th in the world and I was unranked, but I beat her. I had the opportunity and I took it and it changed my life. It really, I, I really felt like that was my trajectory was to, to play tennis um, in, in college and then later. And hopefully uh, my goal was to play on the, the pro tennis circuit. Um, the second week in October, I was still on the high from, from beating Steffi. And this was way before, not way, but it was a few years before she became the number one women's tennis player for seven straight years and truly changed the face of women's tennis before Serena Williams came on board. 
But the second week in October, I won the golf championship for all the DOD high schools in Germany. I told you I was competitive <laughs> and, and it's true. So my schedule at 15 was I would get up at four o'clock in the morning. I would go to tennis practice. Then I would go to my junior year in high school and then I would go to golf practice. That's how driven I was. And it wasn't anything my parents decided that I should do. In fact, I, I think that they would have probably rather stayed in bed on Saturday mornings and um, enjoy the weekend a little bit more instead of watching me go at play at golf tournaments and, and play tennis. But uh, they were huge supporters. So October of 1983 was really special for me. I was getting scholarships already my junior year in high school. The last week in September, I experienced a massive stroke. I was born with a malformed vein that we didn't know about. Now, I had been having headaches for two months, and the pediatricians just figured it was because of my schedule. But um, I, I never lost consciousness, and somehow at 15, I knew I was having a stroke, but I was completely paralyzed on my right side. My face looked like a, burnt, uh, a melted candle for a few days after the bleed. And um, our community came alongside of us because I tell you, we felt like we were going through a final, the big one. My prognosis was if I lived, I would never walk again. I told you I'm competitive. I told you I'm driven. And I don't take no for an answer. <laughs> so at <clears throat> Excuse me. I was in the hospital for six weeks. They ended up sending me to San Antonio from Germany for surgery because I had had my stroke six days after the Beirut bombing of the Marine Corps barracks. And my Sunday school teacher in Germany graduated from the Air Force Academy and his roommate was the number one neurosurgeon in the Air Force. And he was in San Antonio. So see our community that we were embedded in came alongside of us and help take care of us. It took a year and a half to learn to walk again. And the first time I was able to walk without a cane or assistance was to walk across the stage and get my high school diploma. I write with my left hand now. My right hand doesn't work as well. But it was very difficult because I lost my identity. So I had misplaced my identity. I had placed it in my athleticism. But I came to realize after that test, after that tough test, and one of the lessons I had learned was my identity was not based on the athleticism. It was based on my character, who I am inside. I am a hard worker. I am driven. That is my identity. It wasn't based on that one um, being an athlete. The other lessons that my family and I learned, uh, our faith is very important to us. I stand on a firm foundation of faith and I am a daughter of the King. And I can't imagine getting through what we did without him in our faith. That our community was so vitally important and then I am truly stronger than I think I am. My will is stronger um, to, to overcome that adversity. But the lessons that I learned then would come back and help me further in life when I had more tests. Because guess what? I, we are going to go through tests throughout life. That's just a, a fact and adversity. And I am not here to ask you to compare your adversity to my adversities, but we've all been through 10 out of 10 on the pain scale. At that very moment when it happens, whatever it is, it's a 10 out of 10 on the pain scale. So we have empathy for one another. We can be each other's emotional support human. And I had emotional support humans come alongside me and my family during that time. So all of my scholarships were taken away, rightly so. But my dad, when we had lived in San Antonio, when I was in elementary school, he had kept his Texas residency. For the military, it's a really good thing. 
And so um, even though I graduated from high school in Germany, I was a Texas resident. So I went to the University, the University of Texas in Austin on a full scholarship because I was quote unquote handicapped because of my stroke. It was $4 a credit hour when I went in 1985. I should have gotten like three degrees when I was there, but that was the in-state tuition. But I had the full scholarship and I needed to find my community. 53,000 students in 1985, it was the largest university population wise. And even for an uber extrovert, I needed to find my community. So for me, I had lived on military installations my entire life. I hung out at the RTC building. It, and I didn't care what branch of the service ROTC was. I just, I, that was my community. They spoke my language. I did have, enjoy the Air Force a little bit more because we all have different languages between the services. And my junior year, I went to a party. Don't tell my mom. <laughs> I think every college student does that. But I went to a party and there was one, one person I did not know in the room and that really bothered me. So I made a beeline straight to him. And I said, hi, I'm Kristen Anderson. He said, hi, I'm Don Christie. We can never get married. I'm looking at him confused and dazed. And I'm thinking, what kind of pickup line is this? And then he didn't realize that I don't take no for an answer. Five months later, I had that ring on my finger. <laughs> there was something in his eyes that, that just drew me to him. He was fun. And he mentioned that he made the comment because then I would be Kristen Christie. Yep, don't take no for an answer. So we were engaged for two years. And then when he graduated and was commissioned, we, uh, we got married and off to Grand Forks, North Dakota. He was a missileer in the Air Force. Talk about needing your community up there. The distance from the town was 17 miles. The, um, the harsh winters, it was, it was pretty tough. But we started our family and it was great, a great place to, to start our family. And in um, our next assignment after four years there, after getting embedded in the community and helping each other out, because you know, Murphy shows up, especially, or the TDY gremlins, we call them, whenever the military member was off pulling alert or um, on a trip or something, things would happen like the basement would flood and I was eight months pregnant. Or the batteries would explode, not just chirp at 2 a.m., but explode <laughs> in the, the smoke detectors. And that's when we came together to help each other out. So off to Colorado Springs in 1995, we had had Ryan. I was eight months pregnant with our um, younger son, Ben. I'm going to share my screen here with you on our family picture. Um, you can, oh, I need the, the slideshow up. Can you see that, Reed? Yes, ma'am, you're good. Yeah. Do you see the slides? Yep. All right, great. Um, so this is our family. You can see uh, UT Pride. This was taken in 2005 when uh, the Longhorns won the national championship. And may I say that hairdo was popular in 2005. <laughs> but <laughs> this was our family. And we got embedded in our communities uh, everywhere we went. But we came to Colorado Springs. Ben, our youngest son, was born a month after we got here. And we were enjoying uh, living here. It was great uh, in between Austin and Grand Forks, weather-wise, culture-wise. Um, and we were just enjoying our life as a family here. And then in uh, two years after we had moved in, to Colorado Springs, Don came home and said words that still kind of give me goosebumps. He said, I think I need to separate from active duty. He wanted to leave the Air Force. Now, remember, I had grown up in the Air Force. I got my ID card when I was 10 years old, and it may have changed colors and statuses, um, but I, I am military through and through, and he wanted to separate from the military. And I, I was having some anxiety with that. 
But then he explained, wait a minute, there's something called the Air Force Reserve. So he joined the reserve. So we still had the best of both worlds. He was a contractor. We could stay here in Colorado Springs. We could pretty much homestead. And um, he would go further in his career than he would in active duty. And sure enough, he was picked up for a squadron command position. And in 2003, he came home. And I'm so proud of him for this. He came home. He was asking my permission, but not really, because that's not the way the military works. <laughs> um, he said, Kristen, I have been tasked with getting volunteers to go to Baghdad for a deployment. And I don't feel right asking for volunteers unless my name is at the top of the list. I knew then and there he was a true leader. A supervisor or manager will say go, but a leader says let's go. And he said let's go. And off he went because he was the only one chosen from that list, but his name was at the top of that list. And in 2004, he went off to Baghdad. He was second in command of the Baghdad airport. He was gone for four and a half months, which doesn't sound like a whole lot now. We hear of deployments lasting a lot longer, but when you're going through it, it's, it's all you can do to get through that day, um, especially with the media and all. So the boys and I did not watch the news. We didn't pay attention to media at all. He would email us in the morning when uh, we would get his email when the boys woke up before they went to school. And then we would email him at night. So that's the way it worked. We didn't have Skype or anything like that. So the communication was important. And during that time, our communities came together, his community in Baghdad, and then our community at home. And we took care of one another. You know, we aren't made to do life alone. And so we didn't, we, all, we both had our communities, but he did come home different. We hear it a lot. That something in his eyes that drew me to him was clouded. His fingernails were bitten down to the nubs. He was more reserved than usual. Now I'm the extrovert, he was the introvert, opposites attract, right? <laughs> but he was more reserved and I knew something was wrong. Of course, being the spouse, I wanna help make things better. And I wasn't always doing that. You know, it comes down to semantics, right? Yeah, I, I, think, um, I think I'm encouraging and he thinks I'm a nag. <laughs> We, we see it from do, two different areas, um, from two different sides. Um, so we were trying to repair our marriage. We were trying to um, integrate him back into our family and with the boys. And um, we got an assignment. We, we really thought we were gonna homestead in Colorado Springs with him being a reservist, but he was on the fast track. And we got an assignment to Carlisle Barracks in Pennsylvania for our new War College. And I've heard great things about War College. We did it with my dad, went to uh, Alabama. So I thought this would be a great time to reintegrate, to, to really concentrate on our family. And um, off we went. We sold our custom home that we built that we thought was our forever home and uh, spent a year in, in Carlisle and met new people and, and from different branches and from, from different uh, areas and international students were there. It, was, it truly was a fantastic year and we were supposed to go to the Pentagon afterwards. So we were ready for our next adventure. If you get the opportunity, take it. If it changes your life, let it. And we were ready. And then just before graduation, the Air Force changed its mind. <laughs> again and said no we need you back in Colorado Springs and I gotta tell you that was the hardest PCS uh, the hardest move we've had because our community had gone on for 11 months without us we our our frame of mind was we were going to the Pentagon afterwards you kind of have to set yourself up for to live in Virginia in the DC area so we were in that frame of mind and then all of a sudden we had to reframe and we were excited to get back to Colorado Springs. And so <laughs> I don't take no for an answer, but sometimes no is the answer. Um, but I had the chance 
to ring our doorbell of the house that we sold and I asked them if I could buy the house back. The answer was no. But now I know, I, I don't have a woulda, shoulda, coulda um, thought process on the house. So we, we bought a new house, we got embedded in our community, but things still weren't right. And I liken that trip, that, um, that move, back to Colorado Springs, like double Dutch jump rope, where you have two ropes going and you're following it so you don't trip. And unfortunately, we tripped. The coroner showed up at my house and Don had taken his life three days before he pinned on Colonel. I've heard the word catatonic before, but I saw it in my kids' eyes. Our boys, Ben was 12 and Ryan was 14. I made one phone call and our living room and our kitchen were full of people. Our community came alongside of us when we needed them the most. Ben, our 12-year-old, eight years later on his 20th birthday, I woke up to hear this voicemail. can imagine hearing that for the first time. Ben attempted suicide that night. He was off at college in Tucson and his community came alongside of him and helped him when he needed them the most. Our older son Ryan was 14 and this is what I have from him. We are not having technical difficulties. Ryan has been missing for 1,830 days today. Sunday was five years since I've heard from my oldest son. Now, I, I'm not a therapist. I don't have letters behind my name. But his counselors diagnosed him with bipolar. His doctors diagnosed him as bipolar at the age of 16. And my understanding is bipolar typically presents in the early to mid 20s. And I think if he had had more time to mature, things would be very different. Remember, I'm a woman of faith, so I pray that my son is on his side of heaven. But it's a matter of just wanting to know. So a choice that Don had made 
has had rippling effects throughout our family, not just our family, but our community. This is what's left of my family. But I, 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 I want to talk about, even though I feel, I feel that for our family, suicide is contagious. Both of my kids attempted. I don't know if Brian has succeeded or not. But what else is contagious? A smile, a kind word. There are good things that are contagious that don't take any amount of time, do not take any effort on our part. There's another saying that I love. It, it takes nothing away from a burning candle to light another candle. No wick, no wax, no fire. But think of, I think of Christmas Eve service. You have the one candle and we're all singing Silent Night and we pass that, that candle, that light, and the room is illuminated. That's what a kind word and a smile can do. So living in the world of the military, we have acronyms that we live by. And sometimes when you talk to someone and you don't understand the acronyms, the eyes glaze over. I don't want your eyes glazing over here. These are fun acronyms. These are acronyms to help you change the way you're thinking. Like, like Dr. Lowe had talked about, the reframing and our attitude. Secretary Mattis, uh, the, the Secretary of Defense, when he was at the Air Force Academy giving his speech for graduation, he said, our attitude is our greatest weapon system. And it truly is. But here's some acronyms I want you to think about. No, I told you I don't take no for an answer, but it stands for next opportunity, right? And, and as a leader and in your sphere of influence, sometimes you have to say no, especially if you're a parent, right? <laughs> you have to tell your kids no. And then they take the next opportunity to go to the next parent and ask. I've done it when I was a kid. My kids have done it. But when you're in a leadership position, you don't know what that person you're speaking to and that you're giving the answer no to is going through in life. We're, we're on an emotional battlefield and there is no room for strangers on this battlefield. There's no room for silence on this battlefield. So I encourage you next time you have to tell someone no, will you spend a little bit of extra time helping them find the next opportunity? It's so vitally important because we aren't mind readers, but that will help the person that is receiving that no. The next one is fly. First, love yourself. It's taking care of ourselves. It's that self-care. It's like Jen doing the, the breathing. I, Jen, I should have gotten online with you so you weren't the only one, um, you know, on there breathing. You, you didn't look ridiculous. It was good. And I'm going to start using that. I think it's four, seven, eight. But how do you take care of yourself? What do you do? Do you like to go to the gym and work out? Do you like to read? What, what do you do to take care of yourself? Because you've got to sometimes plan that in your schedule. Because you're no good to other people if you aren't good to yourself first. And give of your overwhelmed or your overflow, not your overwhelmed. And in the Air Force, our fight uh, fight phrase is fly, fight, win. When you fly, first you love yourself, then you can fight and win. And your effort never dies. Okay, I talked about that kind word and the smile. You will probably never know the impact that you made on someone. But be assured that that effort you put into that will not die. It doesn't go away. You're going to make that person feel good. Have you ever said something to someone and they kind of light up and then you think about how you react to it and you light up too, it's that burning candle, right? You pass on a light and you illuminated someone's world and they're illuminating yours back. But that effort never dies. PTG, post-traumatic growth or post-test growth. 
Because we learn those lessons and how do we grow from that? To be a better person, to be a better spouse, a better um, son or daughter, a better community member. Those tests are there for us to learn lessons. And it takes that attitude change to understand somewhat of a silver lining. And I have a natural silver lining. So my hair is natural. It came about a year after my stroke. And it reminds me there is a silver lining. And sometimes we don't see it for a few hours, a few days, a few weeks, months, years, decades. Sometimes we never see it, remember, but, but that effort never dies. Fail. I feel like I failed as a spouse and a mother. But fail stands for first attempt in learning or further attempt in learning, but never final attempt in learning. We're always learning from each other and we learn from our mistakes. My son, Ben, the voicemail, when he was 14, he came home and he said, mom, I want to be a wise man, not a smart man. And I'm like, what's the difference, son? <laughs> he said, a smart man learns from his own mistakes and a wise man learns from others' mistakes. So we are all smart and wise in the same day. We learn from each other and we learn from, from the mistakes that we've made, but it's okay. It's okay. And failing is when you're alone too. When Remember, we aren't made to do life alone. And it's more fun when we do it together. But remember, fail is not to be taken as a negative. It's what are the lessons that you've learned and what are those lessons you can impart to other people? Fear, this is a big one too. False evidence appearing real. So we have a number of people, I think 24 was the last time I saw it. If you all had a chance to ask each other what your biggest fear was, they wouldn't be the same thing. We all have different perceptions. And it takes each other to come alongside and see potential in others. Now, I'm not always good at seeing the potential in the mirror for myself. So I have people that are my accountability partners, that are my cheerleaders. Who's your cheerleader? Whose cheerleader are you to help get over those fears? Free. I coined this one and it's foster relationships energetically everywhere. And when I say energetically, I'm not saying bound into a room, um, do cartwheels or, but, but just have that hunger of finding out a deeper connection with a person. But when you can foster those relationships as part of getting embedded in your community. And then the last one is hope. Hold on, pain eases. Now some people say hold on, pain ends. I think you'll understand when I, I say my pain will never end. But I have people that are the capital E in my life. There's always hope, as Dr. Lowe had said. There's always hope. And because there's hope for tomorrow, there's power in today. So I want to introduce you to some of my capital E's in hope. This is Sean. We met on Match.com. It works. <laughs> Sean was a bachelor when I met him. My mom was worried. He was 43. He just says he was waiting his whole life for me. But Sean has been so supportive. I typically travel a lot, especially the month of September. Last year, I was home for 52 hours the whole month. And there were times where I would pack two bags, go to the airport with one, come back for a trip. Sean would meet me at the airport with the new bag. I would transfer my makeup. We would have lunch at the airport, and then I would go right through security for my next trip. And I don't know many spouses who can live in the shadow of a previous life, but he does. He's my biggest, capital E. And then this picture is my son, Ben, my young one, the voicemail. He just turned 25. He's a contractor at Edwards Air Force Base in uh, California. And he was just uh, offered a job by the government. So he's going to be working on retrofitting the B-52s, doing what he loves. 
he's doing okay, but he has his periods where he is not okay. And he calls me and he has people that he calls and he still sees counselors. But he is a capital E for me. And I hope that I am his capital E as well. So let's talk about postvention, what our community did for us. Remember we were embedded in that community? They showed up. I told you I made one phone call after the coroner and the officers left in our community showed up and they continued to show up and they still 12 years later continue to show up for us. So if you have someone within your sphere of influence that is going through a 10 out of 10 on the pain scale, show up. And then do something, not say something. It doesn't say, say something. Because sometimes we as human beings want to say something and it just comes off not the way we intended. So my friend showed up and they did something. I remember one person saying something and a lot of people said something that night. I don't remember what our conversations were, but one person did say, well, he's in a better place. And I know what she meant. But at that moment in time, why isn't the better place at home with his children? But my hairdresser showed up to cut the boy's hair before the funeral. Another friend took my boy shopping for a suit for the funeral. They showed up and they did something. My best friend, her two boys were my boy's best friend. She took them out of school for three days. They lived with us. She, she slept on Don's side of the bed so it wouldn't be empty. They showed up and they did something. And then they were intentional. They continued being intentional. Most, most people, the first 30 or 45 days, if, if someone goes through a tragedy and adversity, we hear from people, we get cards, we get text, well, not so much back then, but um, we get, you know, people are thinking of us, they're reaching out to us. And then it wanes and we're forgotten, which is understandable. Life goes on, right? The world does not revolve around the person who's going through an adversity, but it's still a 10 out of 10 on the pain scale. And we had a few friends that stayed intentional and they reached out to us, not just on the anniversary, not just on the big milestones, but they reached out and just kept that sense of community, that connectedness with us. So I'm giving you all homework. I, I know you all are um, don't have your video on, but most of you are probably at home. You've got your, your phone handy, right? Get your phone. And what I want you to do before you go to bed tonight, and you can even do it now if you want, I want you to go to your contacts on your phone and I want you to, to just scroll up. It's gonna be like the slot machine in Vegas. Just scroll up and, and stop your, put your finger and make it stop. And whatever name that stops at, text that person. Text them something like, hey, I was thinking of you today. Or how are you? Or what hobbies have you taken up during COVID? Or how about what made you smile today? And I do recommend that you put your name at the end of the text message in case they don't have your number in their contact list. But most of you, the majority of you will get a text message back or even a phone call. I've seen it happen before. Two minutes later, after a friend does it, they get a phone call from that person. And guess what? That person needs to hear from you. And if you feel like it, don't just stop at one person. Reach out to a number. Just be really intentional. And if it comes to mind to do it, go with your heart, go with your head, and be intentional and reach out. Text message is pretty easy and safe. No awkward phone conversation if you haven't talked to them in five years, but they're in your contact list for a reason. 
I would love to get feedback on um, what happened with this, with your homework. And then the other one is use a, your resources. So getting it, part of getting embedded in our community was we found out what the resources were ahead of time. The best time to find your resources is when you're in a really good state and a really good place. And it's easy to keep them in your phone. It's easy to have them handy. But find out what, what they are when you're in a good place because when you're in a not so good place, they'll be ready for you. And if someone that you care about is not in a good place, they're going to need you to be that person, to make the phone call, to reach out. But if you've got those resources handy ahead of time, that's the way to do it. So this is um, some helplines. You all probably know about this, the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. Um, and you can also text, they have a texting. So when my phone rings and it's my son, he is more likely to text than not. So I know that it's pretty important when he's calling me. So it's nice that they have uh, the texting capability available. And I am so excited. I did these slides before um, the House of Representatives, this had already passed the Senate. We were waiting for the House of Representatives to vote. They voted uh, last week to pass the three-digit lifeline number of 988. So right now it is sitting on President Trump's desk waiting for his signature to implement 988. So 988 will replace the 1-800-273-TALK. Can you imagine three numbers? We're breaking down barriers. Three numbers to call when you are in a mental health crisis. My understanding, once it's signed, the FCC will have until next summer or 12 months to enact it. But just one more thing to make getting care and asking for help so much easier. And then NAMI, I mean, there are so many and I, I, I could have slides for days and days and I'm sure you all have resources um, that I, I encourage you to share with one another. Um, to find out what those resources are, because there are some hidden gems like Give an Hour for the military. Um, it's uh, professionals who donate an hour a week to, to um, be counselors for the military, and even family extended family members. But there's so many there um, to do that. And then um, I, I bring this picture back up, so resources. So Ben was very much like me when he was in high school. He was an athlete. But on the football field, on the uh, wrestling mat, and um, on the track. So his therapist in high school, his senior year, said, Ben, what are you going to do in college? You don't have scholarships. Are you going to play intramural sports? But, you know, you've got your studies. I really like that counselor. You know, yes, you've got your studies to occupy your time. But what are you going to do to help? with your anxiety and depression. And she had suggested that he take up a mindless hobby. So the girl he liked his senior year in high school was starting a crochet club before school. My son joined the crochet club and he learned to crochet and it was a great hobby for him. It's kind of mindless, you just count and it's creative. But he went off to the University of Arizona in Tucson and um, he did not want his classmates, and then after he joined a fraternity, he did not want them knowing that he, was, he crocheted. So he was a closet crocheter because he knew he had a resource to help him with an his anxiety and depression. So in February of last year, he called me. Remember I said he texts, and so when he calls, it's, I know it's important. <laughs> well, it was important. He was very excited. He called me, he goes, mom, I've gone viral. And I, at that time, made the joke, well, go to urgent care. I'm sure that they could take care of you. <laughs> he goes, mom, you know, I think that was my, uh, uh, my lot in life is to embarrass my son. But um, I said, what are you talking about? He had 150 followers on Instagram and on Twitter. 
he all of a sudden went to 30,000 uh, people following him on Instagram and Twitter. And I said, well, what happened? What did you do? Thinking maybe he did something stupid. <laughs> it's going to be on the nightly news or something or on the Ellen DeGeneres show. Um, but he, uh, he had crocheted a tank top for his girlfriend at the time. He was a senior at the University of, of Arizona in Tucson, taking 20 credit hours in aerospace engineering, waiting for his clearance to come through, uh, looking for a job, trying to graduate on time. And uh, she broke up with him before he had a chance to gift her with this tank top. So he puts the tank top on and takes a picture and puts it up on Instagram and Twitter. All of a sudden, he put it on there to sell it for $45. He all of a sudden had 500 orders for tank tops and halter tops to crochet. And he goes, Mom, what am I going to do? This hobby I took up to, to help me with anxiety and depression has caused more anxiety. I'm trying to graduate. I'm trying to find a job. So we talked about it. Mindset change, reframing. So we did a little semantics. He taught his frat brothers how to brochet. It not only um, helped fulfill all 500 orders to have his subcontractors as his frat brothers, but they learned a hobby to help combat their anxiety and depression as well. Now, this is a young lady who bought the, the halter top from Ben, and I think she wears it better, but I thought that picture of Ben in the halter top was precious. He's going to do whatever it takes to sell that halter top. <laughs> I'm very proud of him using his resources um, in, in that respect. So we have over 1,500 days of observance. So today is National Cherries Jubilee Day. We have National Margarita Day. We have National Rat, Rat Catchers Day. You know what we don't have is a survivor's day. And when I say survivor, I'm not talking about surviving suicide or cancer. We are all survivors. Lost job, broken heart, death, illness. We are all survivors. And so I've been working for eight years. Remember, I don't take no for an answer. Been working on it for eight years to have National Resilience Day. And I think it was going to happen this year. It was, I, I, I was planning on being in the Oval Office. It was going to be signed. And then COVID hit. But the day is March 4th. And I'm looking forward to next year having it enacted March 4th. Because no matter what the obstacle, we put one foot in front of the other. And we march forth and conquer. It's a mindset change. More importantly, we march forth and conquer together. And that's so important. Again, we aren't made to do life alone. Life is a tough, brutal, cruel teacher, whatever, whatever word you want to insert there. We get the test first and then we learn the lesson. And we're on a battlefield, an emotional battlefield where there's no room for strangers because we need to march forth and conquer together more than anything else. So I wanna be a resource for you. This is my info. You can screenshot it, you can take a picture with your phone. Um, I, I truly want to be an emotional support human, if not for you, for someone in your sphere of influence. It gives me the greatest joy to help navigate and tutor people through those lessons. Our adversities may not be the same, but we have an understanding. So I would love if any of you have questions. I have not been paying attention to the chats because I've been looking in the camera because I want to connect with you. So hopefully, Kirsten, have you been monitoring chats or if anyone has questions. Miss Christy, this is Teacher Blossom. Here. I am facilitating the Q&A for this presentation and we do have a question. 
do you know of any specific resources or counselors in the San Antonio slash Austin area that help folks um, who are in recovery from suicide? So um, not specifically for San Antonio or, or Austin. Um, I do recommend if they have a military affiliation uh, to check out Given Hour. Um, you can go on, it's give and A-N-H-O-U-R um, dot org, I believe, and you can put in a zip code and it will come up with a list of um, uh, counselors and professionals that can help in that respect. Are, are you talking military specific or um, just in general? Uh, and I, I'm sorry, I don't like the word just, I shouldn't have used that word, but in general. It appears that the person who asked the question is not interested in military specific Okay, so, so give an hour, even though it's uh, geared toward the military, you can still go in and take a look at um, uh, by zip code and who is available that way. NAMI is a great organization. There are chapters throughout, and I'm, I'm sure San Antonio and Austin have uh, NAMI chapters, and they are there to help um, navigate people to to where they need to go, whether it's services by an organization and a nonprofit or with uh, individual therapists and counselors. So, so check that. Um, I, I would go to NAMI first. That, that's their wheelhouse, the, the National Alliance of, on Mental Illness. Thank you. Are any of those also tied to addiction recovery, to your knowledge? Um, you know, I, they, they would, uh, they would have that information as well. And a lot of times that, it, you know, I have a feeling to Dr. Ed, uh, Dr. Ed, I've been following your chat and your questions and all uh, just amazing. I hope to meet you in person, but if it's not, I apologize, but I've been following Dr. Ed's comments on the addiction part with the, the nonprofit as well. Um, but as, as you know, um, the self-medication. So my son, Ryan, uh, the one who's been missing and was diagnosed, diagnosed with bipolar, was self-medicating with meth and heroin. Uh, and it started with alcohol and um, uh, marijuana with that. So uh, I think that would be a, a good resource. And I can certainly reach out to find out. Um, uh, I can do some investigating as well. Um, you know, the more people, it's safety net, right? The more people we have uh, searching out some information, I think the better. Thank you. Uh, we have one more question. We received a question before today that someone is hoping to have answered. Would you please share, what is your number one advice for students who are concerned about any of their peers? It's hard, we gotta get outside our comfort zone, um, especially student-wise. Um, uh, you know, so we got to just start the conversation. Um, you know, I talked about nagging and encouraging. Uh, I felt I was encouraging and I think Don felt like I was nagging. Um, I, I talk about this phrase a lot being compassionately intrusive. If you ask someone how they're doing and they say, oh, I'm okay but something in your gut is telling you they aren't okay, don't just leave it at that. Take a little bit of time. Um, it's, it's so important to spend time with those people and um, be compassionately intrusive. So you think you're being compassionate. They may think you're intrusive. Just pull it back a little bit. Don't, don't let them go. Sit with them, stay with them, uh, find something, some common ground and just start that conversation. Uh, I, I heard a, a guest speaker one time talk about um, when we cross our arms. So if, if I tell you, just cross your arms, just go ahead and cross your arms um, the way you typically would. Now switch it. And I'm trying to think how to, to switch it and it feels so uncomfortable. But if you keep doing this for a while, it feels more comfortable. And that's the way those conversations go. It feels uncomfortable, but you know, I, 
I would rather ask the question, and sometimes you don't have to say, are you thinking about hurting yourself or taking your life? It can just be, hey, how are you doing? Just start a conversation and get their mind off of that, um, that thought. But listen to your intuition. And if we can get our kids to connect, you know, I, I hear it a lot. Um, how do we get the kids to connect like we connect with each other? Well, they are connecting through technology. They're plugged in, right? They're playing games with people halfway across the world. They're connecting. What I'd like to see is that we are teaching our kids how to connect with that technology. Hey, before you start the game, find out how, you know, her mom's doing or how school's going or, you know, what made them smile um, today. Um, be that person's cheerleader. And you can do that. You can show up without showing up physically. Um, and you can do something without being there physically to do that. Thank you so much. There are no other questions. Great. Thank you for the opportunity. I just want to leave you with this. A lot has been canceled with COVID, but hope has not been canceled and never will be. <sighs> Miss Kristen. <laughs> I'm not putting. This is is this like the sixth time you've heard that voicemail or something like that? You know, I try to, I try to avoid uh, listening to it, but <clears throat> I'm not turning on my video because like a fool, I put on makeup. Um, no, I'm just kidding. I have, uh, I have no shame in being human. It still makes me um, cry uncontrollably. Um, not so much the voicemail. It's that Ryan's still gone. I do pray for him every day mm -hmm. and you. Um, just wanted to publicly thank you as well for sharing your story. I know it is life-changing, life-saving. I wanted to let you know I heard back from my friend um, that I texted. Let me tell you what she said. Yeah. What did you text her? Do you mind sharing? Not at all. Um, I said, um, just want to tell you I love you. I hope you're smiling, having a wonderful day. And I said, what made you smile today? And I put um, a happy face with little hearts. And I put re, and this is what she said. She said, um, I love you too, exclamation, exclamation. Not much smiling going on today because I've been slammed with homework and studying, but your text did make me smile. <laughs> and that's what matters, right? Um, I, I, love, I love her. Uh, she's a, a mini me. She's me 10 years ago. Um, and, uh, so, so you're being a mentor to her, but, you know, see – you didn't know ahead of time that she hadn't had the opportunity to smile or thought about smiling and just reaching out to her that that little act um yeah. and it made me smile listening to you tell us so. <laughs> <laughs> you know that's my favorite part of your presentation though because um a lot of people can be a talking head um, even if they have a powerful story but they don't always give you an action right an after action a uh, here's how you apply what I'm saying right in this very moment. And a lot of times that applicability, you're just left like, that was really great. I hope to be able to apply that to my life one day. And what I love about your testimony is um, it gives life, but it speaks the truth, but you give us an action. Um, oh my gosh, my other friend just replied. I may as well share it too. Um, so I sent the same one to another friend sort of because I'm lazy, but that's why I worded it that way, right? <laughs> could send it to more than one. Happy taste and, uh, is a good thing. <laughs> yeah. She said, oh, thank you so much. I needed this today. Yes, had a great day. When I asked the little girl, do you want to meet uh, Miranda with lunchboxes? And she said, no, LOL. <laughs> I don't know what that means, but it made her laugh. So that's good. And it made you laugh. You all heard it, right? You all heard her laugh too, so... Um, so while we're just um, wrapping up, I wanted to give anyone else, if anyone else heard back, if anyone else did text, throw it in the, the chat or you can raise your hand and we can unmute you. Um, but I do want to, again, formally thank you again for sharing your story. Um, I know while it is healing for you to share, um, I turn off my camera, someone needs to walk by one second. There you go. Go ahead. Um, 
while it might be hard for you to share, it does, um, it does give, give life to me, even though it rips my soul apart. <laughs> it reminds me um, that life happens and community is what got you through that. And, and that is the message, right? The hope and your do something. Um, it reminds me of when Brene Brown is like, you know, usually your words don't make things better. They certainly um, don't make it go away, right? It doesn't undo whatever hurtful action, but doing something can make all the difference. And that resonates with me so much your, with your story. Um, so anyway, yeah. as I go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Well, I, I do feel like San Antonio is part of my community. Um, I wish I could be there in person um, with you all and all that, but uh, I really appreciate the opportunity. And um, I know just from the chats, I'm hoping I connect with more of you, but Dr. Ed, we will connect. Um, I uh, thank you for for sharing that journey. <laughs> um, yeah, let's not do life alone. That's right. All right, so Miss Kirsten, if you're still there, um, I didn't know if you were gonna hop back on or not, but I do want to publicly uh, thank, just before I forget, um, my fellow officers. Um, I didn't wanna make this about us in the beginning, um, but I wanna take the time now to just thank my um, Vice President, Miss Michelle, um, lesson. She was our uh, queen question moderator for the day. Um, and then we also had Allie, who is my secretary. She was monitoring the uh, YouTube questions. I didn't see any come in and she didn't pipe up. So I'm assuming um, there weren't any. And then we also have Miss Hannah Via. Um, there we go. I try to put it so we could see them. If you put it on your gallery view, um, I'm going to spotlight Miss Hannah for a minute, see if I can um, embarrass her. There she is. Isn't she lovely? She's, um, <laughs> she's my media um, director, and she's absolutely wonderful. To be honest, right when I think I'm busy, I remember Hannah, and I'm like, oh, wait, I've got time. Um, and then we also had Miss Kirsten Avey, who actually works for APUS, American Public University System. She's our wonderful MC and does a million times better than I could ever do. So I love that she takes the time to do this. Um, we also had, have or had at least our um, advisors, Dr. Mary Cooper, if you heard the first presentation, she's one of our advisors with her Georgian accent. Um, and then our other ones were on too, but I think they had to go to work. We also have Miss Janet Athanasiu, I think is how you say it. I say it wrong every time, I, I own it. And then we also have Dr. Rat um, Liv, who will be speaking tomorrow. I'm super excited about that. Last but not least, oh, there's Allie. Let me spotlight her real quick. I want to embarrass her too. Woohoo! Here's Allie. Yay! My wonderful secretary. <laughs> um, couldn't ask for a better um, officer team. Um, last but not least, I want to formally thank Ms. Jen Blazier. Um, I know you guys. Um, there she is. I know you guys loved her um, self-care kind of things that we did. I loved it. I was kind of hoping one of her dogs would bark, um, but that was just me being devious. There's one of them. Don't want that. <laughs> not during, not during our mental, mental mo moments. Um, but you know, Jen is just she's one of my rocks. She's also a mental health supporter. Um, and she's one of my people I know if I call it two in the morning, she's not going to be like, what the heck, Re I'm sleep. She's going to be like, where are you? Where do you need me to be? Right. And we need those kind of people in our lives. We need our community, like Christy was saying, people that um, if we call and we go, I don't need advice. I just need to cry for five minutes or I just need to scream and vent for five minutes. They're not going to take it personally. They're going to let us because they know it helps our mental health. Right. Um, I always say I have a punching bag here in my living room. My door is open to my friends. Sometimes you want to choke your kid out. Don't choke your kid out. Come to my house. Take it out on my punching bag. That's what it's for, right? So mental health is something that we believe strongly in, um, so much so that we hold this symposium um, 
each year to have a safe place to have people share and learn um, and and feel connected with other people. Um, like I hate to say, but it's true anymore. Um, everybody knows someone that has had cancer and it's getting to the point everyone knows someone who's been touched by suicide, right? Whether it be completion or attempt. Um, and losing my grandfather to, to suicide, I can't talk about it because you see what happens. Um, that was what really kickstarted my mental health journey with my baby cousin walking by. Um, but, you know, uh, I had to learn that it wasn't my fault, that I didn't know the signs. Like, I had to learn all this stuff. I didn't know. And there wasn't um, a community to support me that knew what to do. So um, this is why I don't turn on my camera. Uh, <laughs> so in wrapping up and closing, um, this is just closing for today. We will be back tomorrow with um, three more presentations. We, um, we have a survivor panel I'm super excited about coming up tomorrow. Uh, we've never done that before. Um, might have tissues nearby for that one. I know I will, or just a shirt that I can get snotty, whatever. Um, but we also have Robin Suchi from Active Minds National on with us tomorrow. So I'm super excited. It, I want you guys to know there are over 600 chapters around the nation and they take the time to support us on this level. So he's going to come and actually um, be kind of our van like Kirsten was today <laughs> um, and is excited to do so. And that really means a lot. Um, so tomorrow we have um, Ms. Um, Jennifer Ellers here. I'm going to turn off my camera and then show you just our preview for tomorrow. And then we will um, stop, stop the recording anyway so that we can move right along. Let me share this with you real quick. Here we go, now I have to do it from memory. So we have Ms. Jennifer Ellers. I'm very excited to say that she, um, she'll give you her background, but I'll, I'll have you know that she has been working in crisis management for a long time. Um, she does first responder stuff. She, she knows stats that break my heart to even hear, so I don't know how she keeps them in her head, but she recently transitioned into working in the correctional facilities. And when she asked me, she almost was like, will it be okay like if I talk about this? And I was like, um, yeah, people in um, prison are people too, first of all, just like drug addicts are people too. Um, suicide matters, no matter who you are, you matter. No matter where you are, you matter. And so she actually has a job where she's doing some kind of ministry in the prison. I don't know exactly, she'll share with us. Um, but even if um, we're not speaking about the people in the correctional facility, they have families, right? So imagine having your dad or, or cousin in, in prison and then they take their own life, right? Where's the support for that person? Because they're probably like, well, it was a criminal, right? And there's probably a little less empathy sometimes. So we're gonna hear, um, we're gonna hear about that tomorrow. Then we have Dr. Ratliff. Um, it doesn't get any more amazing than Dr. Ratliff. And I do everything I can to praise her because I wish I were a little more like her um, in every way. She's that amazing. So she's gonna speak tomorrow on developing a culture um, of caring on campuses. And she's super qualified to speak on that. Um, and then lastly, um, we have the survivor panel. So the reason Ms. D. Lundgren is up here is um, I invited her to be a part of the panel. She is a survivor. She'll tell her story tomorrow as well, but she also, um, much like Kristen, um, shares her story to give life and give hope. So I am, I'm ready for that. I'm excited. I'm also very, very, very full from today. So thank you again to all who um, are in attendance and who attended, who plan to attend tomorrow. And we will begin at 12 o'clock Eastern tomorrow, same place, um, online, YouTube, and Zoom. And um, Kirsten or Allie or anyone, am I forgetting anything else before we stop recording for today? Have I forgotten to thank anyone? Um, Forgot to thank yourself. Mm -hmm. so well, that I'll would thank you. All that you do. <laughs> <laughs>
So, yes, definitely. You wrapped up everything. Everything I was going to say here, you did it. So I'm, I'm good. But I want to make sure that, you know, we thank you as well for all that you do. So. Oh, thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, because I need to go fix my face now. Yay. Thank you, Christine. And everybody take time to do self-care and stay safe and stay well for sure. Absolutely. And if we don't see you tomorrow, have a wonderful, um, safe weekend. And as soon as you get a chance to safely do it, hug someone and tell them that they matter. Virtual hug. There we go. <laughs>